Welcome to the Basin Conspiracy. I'm Ineash Brodsky. I'm Stephen Zuber. And with us today, we have once again, Shelly. Yep. Who is here to talk with us some more about the transhumanism, because we had to wrap up a little early last time. And also, since we have been neglecting listener feedback for a while, jumping into some listener feedback. So let's start off with that, and then maybe we will edit this into the back part of the show, or maybe we will just do things backwards today. Backwards. It's crazy backwards day. In the transhumanist future, everyone will do everything backwards. Ooh. <laughs> you guys, have you guys seen Memento? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Love Memento. Uh, right after it came out, we could probably like uh, cut this out later, but right after Memento came out, um, there was like this rash of everyone doing everything backwards, right? Oh, there really? was a backwards Jerry Seinfeld episode, yeah, oh. and all that. And, oh, there was. I remember yeah. that episode. <laughs> oh, yeah. There was a bunch of things that just did things backwards, and... It got to be like, I knew someone was like, I am just sick. I, I think Memento's stupid because they did backwards for no good reason. Now everyone's <laughs> doing things backwards. I was like, no, no, no. Everyone else is doing it because it's a fad because Memento did it so well. But Memento had to tell the story backwards because it's the only way you as the audience get uh, the experience of not being able to remember what just happened. Because you haven't seen it yet. So you're going through it the same way he has where you don't know what just happened. I never actually saw Memento. Oh my god, it's so good. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get around to it. And it's like a circular storyline, so the beginning is the ending. Ooh. Which is why we're telling it backwards also works very well. Gotcha. I remember at the end of the Seinfeld episode, <laughs> it's like flashes 10 years earlier. And, well, who cares, actually? No, no, no. <laughs> um, doing listener feedback at the beginning will, will not have that cool effect. Just No, no. It's sadly <laughs> it's not. Much. Unless we, like air it backwards and have to play it backwards to listen and since no one has like a tape or like a button that does that then it would just be some secret encoded message well i mean and you can probably cut all of this i'm probably <laughs> audacity can play backwards like, there's probably a fair bit of programs out there that can play things backwards now <laughs> not like a podcast app though maybe some no. iPhone one. I guess it's not really a useful feature. People generally don't put backwards podcasts out. Yet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, from Based and Confused, speaking about our recreational drugs episode. That's an awesome name, by the way. Yes. <laughs> I heard a few times the implication that the frame of mind one inhabits during a trip is somehow less useful than the one we have when we're sober. And they tried to draw an analogy. Imagine that the parts of your cognition are an orchestra. Now, at first, you start using your brain as a baby or just banging around and making noise, but eventually you settle onto a type of thinking that you could consider like classical orchestral music. And the intricacy of what you can perform there is incredible. But when taking a psychedelic, suddenly all that sheet music you've been using is uh, switched out for experimental jazz. And the first time you try it, it's going to be extremely uncomfortable. But at the same time, there's going to be moments where you have this new interplay of sound that you never tried before and will come up with revelations that are perfectly valid and completely rational, but would not have been, uh, not have been available to you with your old way of thinking. If now the orchestra that plays classical music as I function in my daily and rational life reaches a problem that is causing me a lot of stress, I can access a whole nother set of reasoning skills that are just as viable and logical, but from a very different angle. And I think that is a very useful and incredible ability. Did they say they used psychedelics? Yeah, I assume so. I can only assume so. I would hope so. I mean, my, I have limited experience. My experience was not like that. Okay. I imagine if you do it for an... Uh, Often enough, probably a few times a year, maybe after a few years, you can get you can get to a place where you're still functional and just having a different set of of you know orchestra directions on your brain. I think yeah. more like a kind of a kind of a phase shift in those sorts of games where you can like swap the gravity or something. Maybe you want to uh, start with this one. Yeah, I feel like I have not experienced the higher doses. I think I, what I did was about the same as what you did, Stephen. So it, it's hard for me to say, like. If at those higher doses where people do talk about uh, coming to having some thoughts that seem pretty irrational to me, if if that is something that you could just get used to and then start thinking logically in those states too, but I I don't. I Were you haven't. unable to like think things well in those states? I don't no. I don't feel like I was. I don't, I don't feel like I was illogical or. Like, you know how sometimes w when you're half, we're just waking up, your brain is still like pretty illogical just in that moment. And then you're like, what? Why did I think that stupid thing? I was like still having a dream. That's pretty much my only experience <laughs> of, of, uh, 
lucid rationality, I guess. And it's hard for me to imagine being learning to, to think properly in that state either. Maybe he has magic superpowers. Yeah. Not magic superpowers, but trained superpowers. I just read the rest of that comment, and uh, yeah, they said they'd used, uh, they have a, a pattern that they use that they're, they're actually experts and they're not talking, like speculating. Okay. And if that works for you, go for it. Um, that does none of us like here have that kind of experience, so maybe it does take some training to get into, maybe like transitioning to smooth jazz. <laughs> so, I mean, the first time, you, you can't just play experimental jazz. Not your first time anyway. It sounds like crap. You can't. Oh, shit. <laughs> um, uh, honestly, I can't play any instrument, so... <laughs> yeah. I could play the clackety plastic guitar. I can blow a mean jug. Can you really? Mm, I mean, yeah. maybe? How hard, can, how hard can it be? I mean, if you want to blow a mean jug, it's probably pretty tough. It fights back. Um, <laughs> no, I... <laughs> I actually meant it metaphorically. I know. <laughs> So did I. I don't know. I'm running, I'm running, I'm running out of ways to, ch to chase this. So, I mean, I think the, the, the general resistance to it, though, is that there's uh, there's less... I mean, so you're, you're... Right now, anyone's lucid perception of reality is, you know, only taken in through, you know, incomplete or otherwise transmitted and scrambled and re-unscrambled sense data, right? Like, you don't, you don't perceive the world directly. You get photons bouncing off the walls to your eyes and that's all processed to like paint this picture in your head that's somewhat close to how things actually look otherwise you know we'd be walking into stuff all the time but it's not perfect i don't think that using psychedelics makes your maybe maybe the people who speak about it like inhibiting you as a rational thinker or something talk about it specifically like in the imperial empiricist sense that your especially your uh your senses of like sight and uh, hearing are radically altered if you're on psychedelics. Uh, maybe maybe if you're an expert, it's different. But uh, for the amateur, my perceptions of like sense data were not at like stopped representing reality and in any meaningful way. So I think that's what people talk about. Like when you're not being pro like it's not productive. But I mean, so, I guess I don't. I'm not sure if productive is the right word. I want to argue with you because I was sitting you at the time and you were basically functional you could walk around and not fall into things you knew that you know what you were seeing was an artifact of the drug and you could talk just fine you you seemed like a a normal person having a very interesting journey as opposed to uh my senses are not working a i took a modest dose and b i think a lot of that came through from me pretending to feel like look like i don't know what i'm doing a lot of the time like when i'm not high okay. <laughs> so i think that just translated over really well right. um I mean, so yeah, from the outside, I, I did know that things like I, I didn't lose the, the knowledge that I'd taken something that was altering my perceptions. Mm -hmm. If I'd taken three times what I did, I very well may have lost that, oh. that knowledge. Okay. And so I would just be sitting there having these weird experiences and I wouldn't, again, maybe if I have practice, I want to keep caveating, but that would be, that would have been a very different state of affairs for me. I'd be watching the walls moving and, you know, everything vibrating or whatever, uh, and have really no idea that it was unusual or what was going on. Um, mm. There were times where I tried to like break down that layer of perception when I was, you know, having that day. But it, I, I get this sense that it would have been more complete had I been able to get higher on that trip. Do you think it would have shut down your brain that much? Yes. Okay. I, I can only speculate that from like the glimpses that I had and uh, like reported experience from other people. Shelly, this one's aimed at you. Uh, sorry, am high posted. <laughs> uh, cool. Someone said something like, I don't want to be more open. I know it's easy to think about this while I'm, when I'm not in the middle of the conversation, but I really wish someone would have asked, how come? How come? Oh, well, I'm just like, in general, a picky person. I like being picky. I want to be more picky. <laughs> you want to be more picky? And, yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I generally more enjoy and also more improve of um, the idea of wanting something first and then getting it and then liking it whether, rather than being like, oh, some random thing happened and it wasn't what I've always dreamed of, but it was cool. Like, I mean, that's all right, but I, I'd much rather be like goal-directed enjoyer. <laughs> okay. I think I can back you up there. Yeah. I like it when things that I like happen by accident, but... I mean, the alternative is just like throwing the dice and having a bunch of bad experiences and, you know, yeah. occasionally landing on one like, yeah, I guess I could do that again. Yeah. And I don't, 
Like, I value information because it's useful, but I don't really value just experience for the sake of experience. Mm -hmm. And I don't, like, if I had to choose to go in one direction, I would go more in the direction of being even more picky than I am. Hmm. I admit that there is such a thing as too picky, but I'm not anywhere close to that for my tastes. <laughs> I th oh, so, yeah, I, I think that being more picky is sometimes a really good thing, uh, especially if you tend to make dumb choices a lot, <laughs> which you don't, but uh, there are people who do. Uh, but I, I really, when, when, when you, Stephen, you said just like throwing random dice and most of the time you get crap and every now and then you get something good. I, I disagree. I mean, yes, you do most of the time get crap, but the, the fact is if you didn't throw those dice all those times, you wouldn't find those few good things every now and then. And sure. I have had just like the most random acts of serendipity we're like, I do not know what I want to do for this scene. And then all of a sudden, like, I hear something on the radio and I'm like, oh, that's perfect. It's going right there. And <laughs> no, that's great. And I mean, those things happen. I think maybe what I'm unless assuming that Shelly and I are on the same page, I think what what I'm trying to get at anyway is that like I prefer to do that like in a controlled way. Like I found my favorite comedian through a random shuffle on Pandora. OK. And so like that kind of thing is great. Yeah. Um, but I mean, and you have to like, go through a lot of crap before you find the few you like. Yeah. And like, I don't like onions. Unless they're like you know prepared in like certain ways, uh -huh. but like just like big slices of onions on sandwiches or something, I hate that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't like that the last ten times. I won't like that tomorrow, right? <laughs> right. So yeah. like, I think that level of picky, That's like, not really I'm just saying randomness, like, though. That's always an onion. <laughs> it's true. So I guess I'm, uh, I'm just defending general pickiness there. Okay. Also, if you actually were open to everything and were cool and, and liked everything, that would be almost just like the, the other end of being wireheaded and just loving everything that you experience. Like if you have no preferences, then everything is just blah. It's yeah. a, just a sea of neutral in a way. Yeah. I think there's a difference between being open to trying stuff and, you know, being and not having preferences, right? Yeah. Like you can, you can try a bunch of things and hate most of them. And like, that's still a preference. You're just still trying new stuff. And to so, me, I'm just like, why would I waste yeah. the time? I hate doing things. <laughs> right? so. I also hate <laughs> things and stuff. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I, the, in the specific context that we were talking about, um, is about how people who do mushrooms in particular was the study. Um, after doing psilocybin one time, uh, they permanently became more open to experience, which is one of those major personality measurements that, that exist. So I'm not super familiar with that, like how you measure that. But if I had to imagine what... What it's like to be more open to experience versus less? Is it just like a greater risk taking? Like this might suck, but I'm willing to find out. Is that what that is? I would assume or... so. It's more like a eh, let's see what happens. More exploration, less exploitation. Hmm. I mean, that might be part of it. I think the only way that I mean, here I am trying to think of years ago remembering reading stuff in Psych. I think most of that's like self-report. Like I tend to try new things. I like to go out, you mm. know, do stuff. Like that's the like those are the sort of questions they ask you on a personality assessment. So I guess that would be more of a: Are you driven to explore things by yourself normally? Because like I tend to go out is a directed activity, right? It's not like just I'm open to things randomly happening to me. It's I enjoy going out and seeing I if anything is different tonight. I can't remember any of the specific questions. I think the things like that, and they might cover both of those kinds of things, but I'm not sure. Because it seems like you could just sum that up as being willing to take risks. Instead, like, but what's the difference between... Nothing yeah. that I can think of. But then it wouldn't spell OCEAN as a good acronym. Oh. So, <laughs> like, willingness to take risks. If you replace the O, yeah. Or, like, willingness to take risks in the particular domain of experiences. But, I mean, everything's experience. Uh. Yeah, but there's a difference between... Being willing to try new experiences and being willing to, I don't know, rush some, what, what is a, what is a risky activity? Driving really fast. That is, that is very risk tolerant behavior. Or like going to a new club or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think that going to the new club would be more of a openness thing. Whereas a driving recklessly and fast is more of a just not caring about risks. Thing. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's a fair point. Also, I dropped an acronym. Ocean is uh, spelled like it sounds. It's the acronym for the big five personality traits that are oh. easily Googleable. Cool. Do you remember what they are offhand? Openness, conscientiousness. Uh, Extroversion. Extroversion. Agreeableness. Agreeableness and neuroticism. Yeah. Where's the N? 
Neuroticism. Neuroticism. Oh, yeah. I thought you said eroticism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, eroticism is one of the big five. <laughs> we can just drop a, what was the E? I can't remember. Extroversion. Yeah, we'll drop that and put eroticism. Yeah. yeah. The new big five 2.0. <laughs> Better big five. But you know, I am actually very open to experience when it comes to food. Um, I always want to try new foods, and yet I still have strong preferences regarding food. It's weird. I don't have very strong preferences regarding food, and I'm also not very open about new food experiences. <laughs> I'm like, just give me the same thing I've always had, please. <laughs> it's worked well so far. Interesting. Mm. I'm kind of more in that camp, too. I, 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 it gets weird. I rarely regret trying new things, even like <laughs> if I hated it. I'm like, well, okay, I tried that and knock it off the list, but I hate the thought of doing new things, if that makes any sense. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't think I'm quite lined up there. My, my uh, wires are crossed somewhere. You, <laughs> you don't really want to, but after you do it, you'll, you're kind of cool with it. I'm kind of like that with literally everything. Like yeah. even like starting a new TV show, I'm like, Ugh, all these new character names and plot <laughs> stuff. And then I watched it. I'm like, oh, that was, I don't regret doing that for the most part. Neophobia. Yes. Well, hopefully not super phobic, but <laughs> neo-aversion. Mm-hmm. This is not really a comment, but I wanted to bring up that after we recorded that episode at Slate Star Codex, there was a a blog post put up commenting on the weird inability of the pharmaceutical industry to discover anything very groundbreaking over the last several decades. They just, you know, have little minor improvements here and there to, to the normal stuff. And the really big groundbreaking discoveries, the discovery that MDMA is good for treating PTSD and ket God, I don't remember. I should have written the word ketamine. Ketamine, ketamine okay, injections are work really well for depression, were both found out by random druggies using things to get high. Yeah. And you and just pointing out that maybe, you know, recreational drug use has side effects in the in the uh positive benefits in the whole helping to treat mental illness just through a bunch of people experimenting on themselves randomly, sort of thing. Because of the pharmaceutical industry spent this much time and billions of dollars of effort and can't find anything, but random random hippies trying to get high finds it. <laughs> Maybe that's a, a good benefit to society. It certainly provides an incentive to explore if you, you get to get high. Yeah. <laughs> science. The history of science has a great history of uh, people who put their necks on the line for science mm-hmm. to see, like, I wonder, if, like, I wonder if it, what what happens if this happens. This should work. And <laughs> yeah. then you know, putting everything on the line to to test it. This is a little less intense than that, but I'm I'm all I, I guess I don't know if I'm all for it. That's probably too strong, but I, I have a soft spot for self driven science. Although be careful doing science in yourself. Let's just yeah. 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 I I, <laughs> I mean it's a very inspirational story that Benjamin Franklin was like, Hey, I think lightning is electricity. Let's see what happens if I fly a metal <laughs> right. kite up there. But apparently like one or two people every year die trying to recreate no that. No kidding. Yeah. So probably a bad idea. He got lucky. He did get very lucky, yeah. I think he also had some moderately okay precautions, but also very lucky. (laughs) That's amazing. I didn't know people died still doing... Like, what are they thinking? Well, they're thinking this was a really awesome thing that Benjamin Franklin did. I bet I can do it too. Uh, There's a good Skeptoid episode on like weird shit people did to themselves in the history of science, and some Mm -hmm. of them are way more dangerous and stupid than what Franklin did. (laughs) And none of me is like, let's try that out. They did it, and they turned out okay. (laughs) Um, I mean... The closest I might do is like just to see if I could attract a lightning bolt. I might like tie a, something on a kite and fly it in a storm, but then I would like tape it, you know, and then leave. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then come Gosh. back and get the camera and knock it, you know. <laughs> if the camera's blown up, then I'm like, oh, I sure dodged a bullet there, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. I have heard, and I, I put a, a reasonably high amount of credence in this story, that all of our artificial sweeteners uh, that we know of today. Not like natural ones like stevie or whatever, but artificial sweeteners that are created in a lab were discovered by people having poor lab safety practices <laughs> and accidentally tasting the chemicals and be like, hey, this is sweet. Awesome. <laughs> A little terrifying if you work in a yeah. lab, I imagine. <laughs> okay. I, Mr. Oliva, again, staying on the recreational drug, drugs theme. Apparently people were interested in drugs. Who would have thought? Uh, Mr. Oliva says, I've always thought of music as a low-key drug. It's a way to make physical stimulus and use it to create a mental change. Or to take physical stimulus and use it to create a mental change. And I, I think I agree to that to some extent. But then Kelty Booty 2... No, sorry. Kelty Boob 2 <laughs> <laughs> says, yeah, I recently came to this conclusion. I'm also worried what effects does music have in the long term? Womp. You are the one person saving his brain, Stephen. 
I listen to music. No, you don't. <laughs> my <laughs> my model of you is forever the person who d- does not like music. I came out less enthusiastic than the average person about music once to Inyash, and he has in his head, like, you hate music, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, You're like the Grinch of music. Aww. That's right. It's all the worst. Not my real opinion. I see the, the general thrust of what Mr. Olive Law was getting at, but I... I sort of, I think we talked about this. There's that one word for drug that encompasses everything, apparently from music to like, you know, 600 micrograms of LSD. Mm-hmm. And that's just too broad, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's... And but if as, we want to stick with things that chemically affect your, your brain. Well, I mean, at least, I don't know. It, it seems like having that one word to map onto all those things just makes it kind of pointless. Mm-hmm. But I just, like the general point is there. Like we mm-hmm. use, we use less, more extreme examples of like skydiving. Yeah, and people talk about like running and runners highs, and you know, like, you know, endorphins are a thing that people get when they work out and stuff. So, those are all like drugs in that same category. It's an interesting point because, yeah, when I think of drugs, I think of like chemicals that you ingest to alter your biology. But a lot of people do say like you know, endorphins and adrenaline; those are both chemicals. Just your own body produced them. Right, and people do BDSM specifically uh, to get into an altered state. Huh. That- like, I'm not going to say everyone, of course. Not, yeah. not everyone does it that for that reason. But certain people do it to get into that altered state. Cool. The altered state of? For some people, it's induced by pain. or It's like a floaty, druggy uh, state of being. Sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Because, yeah. like, I mean, a lot of us do a lot of sex acts because they put in us in a state of mind that we enjoy, right? Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I guess there... There are a lot of old traditions of ex- ex- inflicting a lot of, uh, like, non permanent damage on yourself just inflict pain in order to get like a spirit journey or whatever it is yeah i don't know how self-flagellation became popular yeah yeah and and yeah some cultures have those like intense uh rituals like hanging yourself from hooks yeah and i can imagine there's a lot of things going on there um just the the knowing that you can get through the the pain will uh, probably gives you a great sense of you know strength and and resilience, um, but also it, it probably does put a lot of people into this trance-like uh, spiritual feeling state. Uh, this one I think was actually uh, a good one to to write about because we may have given the wrong impression. Not without incident says, I was really surprised to hear you all shitting on 12-step programs for treating alcoholism just because people can moderate their drinking on their own. Project Match has been thoroughly discredited and more genetic contributions are contributors are being discovered all the time. We know now that some people respond better to different treatments and will have a very hard time stopping without help. I'm in no way trying to play down what Inyash and others have accomplished by quitting smoking, excessive drinking, or other drugs. It's super impressive and I would never suggest it was easy for you because of your genetics. I just got a bit of anyone can quit drinking without therapeutic or pharmaceutical help vibe. And if that, and if that was the argument, I'd like to push back strongly. And uh, yes, I, I also, after he put it that way, I kind of felt like a huge elitist jerk because obviously there's a lot of genetic contrib- contributions and also just sociological, you know, what support nets you have. Oh, I, f- I really strongly do believe that a lot of people need treatment. I just don't think it, it, 12-step is likely to be that great of a treatment for most people. Yeah. I think I can dig up something on this, and I will post it either way. Um, I remember either reading that the 12-step program, as just, as like the one that, what is it, uh, AA, mm-hmm. is less effective than similar programs that are like less religious. Yes. Um, so AA like it, is super effective for a very specific type of um, mental architecture. And for those people, it works wonders, and they get really like deeply passionate about it. But for most people, it is not the best way to quit at all. Yeah, so in that way, I'm I'm against AA as like a required mandate. Yeah, I would be. I'd much prefer if like a judge said you have to go to some sort of program. Yeah. Yes, and and you'll figure it out. Or the fact you know, that your AA lawyers will became it out. the default was kind of harmful. Yeah, that's why I have a a uh, hard spot, I guess, for AA. But that said, I if we came off as anti-program for people, I'd certainly no, hope that wasn't, uh, uh, or I'd like at least to correct the record on that. That that's not, I think, or any of our opinions. If you need a program, you know, yeah. whatever works for you, go nuts. And I will say that I believe 12 step does better than no treatment at all. Like if it's a choice between those two, 12 step is probably going to be the winner. But compared to other treatments, it's hard to to ha- to find any evidence that says that the improvements are due to the specific things that AA, you know, the, the specific details of of AA rather than just that you're doing something, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? 
I heard that for most most types of, of mental architecture, it's not really that much better than doing nothing at all. And with AA, since they are both so overtly and strongly Christian, or or they pretend they're not Christian and they're just some deity out there, but they're they're at least very strongly religious and most people can see yes it's christian i sort of have an issue of that with that specifically i'm like it seems like you are simply replacing the dependence on drugs with dependence on your religion that the whole i am worthless and i cannot do anything myself and i must give up everything over to the higher power and they can save me is i don't think very healthy again for most people for some people it works great yeah, and it, even if it's not the most healthy thing, it's probably healthier than alcoholism. So, mm-hmm. like, if yeah. that's what I mean, I'm just saying, if that's what helps you, then yeah. go for it. Yeah. But you're right; it is yeah. a specific kind of person who would respond to that. But uh, that having been said, I I take antidepressants, and I have you know run into some people that are like, "Stop taking antidepressants! All you got to do is exercise and think uh. good about yourself and that kind of stuff." I'm like, "Fuck you!" So there's yeah, there is definitely both pharmaceutical and therapeutic treatments that help people and that are very important. And I don't want to say to anyone like, oh, you just aren't, you know, pulling yourself by your, up by your bootstraps or anything. As I, I did not mean to come across as giving that impression. Those things are very valuable. It's just that you don't always need them necessarily. And I've heard about half of people end up not using them at all. But then there's also, you know, the other half and the fact that it can help people even if they don't use them that much. Many people, I was surprised by this, so I'm not going to quote any one person, but there were a lot of people that wrote in to say basically along the line, things along the lines of, uh, I have come to accept that I cannot really perceive what's truly real, and I recognize that my perceptions are just uh, the only thing I have to go on. And I wasn't sure exactly how to reply to that or if we even want to get into it. I think it could be, I mean... Is that like a whole What's the episode? question? Like, I, I know, I'm not being facetious. Like, what what exactly is the topic there to dive into? Like, yes, our perceptions aren't perfect, but like I said, we're they're not so wrong that we're constantly being hit by cars. Yeah, right. So, but uh, I've heard I've heard some people say things along the lines of they're so wrong that we have no idea at all what's out there. Well, those people, I mean, throw something at their head and watch them dodge it, right? <laughs> right. Like, oh, yeah. But have they will say in- that is very that is a very evolutionarily adaptive. I can make it so that this cluster of atoms doesn't get hit in the head by things, but are atoms even real and what's going on? I don't know. I don't know what to make of those sorts of arguments. Like, obviously, there's something that we can out there that we are interacting with. And even if it's not the deep quantum state that everything runs on, it's there. It's, it's still a thing. Yeah, I'm not super convinced by people who say things like that. Like, I mean, they don't... Something, something, making beliefs pay rent, something, something. <laughs> yes. Like, uh, what what are they possibly believing that has any impact in the world with that? Like, they, they could say these things, but they don't really do anything. Do we right? want to throw open, like, a if anyone wants to come on the episode and talk to us about this particular belief thing? Or at least, at the very least, write in a coherent version of... I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be an asshole. I just don't really understand what a steel man version of that position looks like. Do you have any? I'm no, no, I don't. Um, (laughs) but maybe they're just pointing out the fact that it's not 100%. Like there's always that slim infinitesimal chance that you're, you're totally being deluded, but it it is slim. (laughs) Yeah. I, that's probably, I, I mean, I think there's too many versions of this argument to have some, have one response, like hit all of them. But yeah, that's part of it that, you know, what if everything's like this, right? Yeah, like what then, if you're a Boltzmann brain? Yeah, then like the answer to that is 1% doesn't mean that, like a 1% chance of something doesn't mean that it's reasonable to believe that thing yeah. or even that it's permissible if you're trying to be rationally consistent to believe that thing, right? I mean, most UFOs that people see in the in the night sky are, you know, airplanes or shooting stars or something. Um, I'm prepared to say all of them, but, you mm-hmm. know, since I can't prove that, whatever. Uh, if I saw, you know, five planes fly by and then i see another one i'm like i'll bet that one's a ufo well you can't prove that it's not there's there's a non-zero chance right am i at all reasonable to believe that no there's so much uh there's so many so much burden of proof and there's so that's such a grand claim to make that it's just unreasonable to put that forward well but when you're questioning the whole concept of proof proof at all then i think things get a little shakier but what my response to that is just like you have two choices do the best you can or give up on life, right? And, and that's what most of the comments ended up <laughs> yeah. saying is like, and I just do the best I can. Yeah. But 
I don't know. I, I, I think back to Eliezer's post about uh, having beliefs that are entangled with reality, that when I believe that my shoelaces are untied, it's because there's a physical thing down there, which a photon came from the sun and interacted with it and then came shot off into my eyes and it interacted with my eyes and those interacted by sending neurons firing into my brain. And so there's this whole chain of causal events that is, you know, entangled with the physical world around me. So even if I'm not seeing the original quantum flux of things that are happening, it's still a chain of events that is entangled with what is out there. I think the the extreme version of this question is that entanglement mm -hmm. that like there are no, I mean, could be like, are your shoes untied in the matrix? <laughs> like <laughs> yes and no, depending on how you want to answer that question. So, I mean, again, I sort of find most of that just sort of uninteresting, not again, not being mean, I'm not being dismissive. If that's what you think and you're being chill about it, that's cool. I just, I don't find it. I don't know. I think I went briefly through this period where I was thinking about that sort of thing. And then I just kind of was, I remember having this thing when I was a teenager, I was trying to think of like, how do you persuade somebody that logic and consistency matter if they're doubting that logic and cons consistent consistency matter. Mm. And then I eventually realized, I think years after I like just gave up on thinking, maybe months after I started thinking about that, that I was like, you know what? There's nobody who actually operates that way. Yeah. Like, so that was, that was my failing is I was trying to answer the wrong question. I should have asked, do these people actually exist? And no one thinks that logic and, and consistency don't matter. Cause like they still look both ways before crossing the street, even if they don't think that, you know, things are real. Yeah. yeah. So they, they, they're not, they're not being consistent if they're saying these things. So that's why I think it's just these empty hanging beliefs that might've been a bit rambly. <laughs> so going off the topic of recreational drugs and stepping back one to the uh, new, new, new tropics. Damn, yeah. How do you pronounce it again? Nootropics, nootropics. Nootropics, okay. Gadbeeb, I guess. I'm not sure how to pronounce the name. Uh, on the forums at slash r, on Reddit, slash r, slash the Basin Conspiracy, says, I figured some folks might be interested in some information I've come across in my further reading on Modafinil. Here are the most common side effects according to the British National Formulary? Formulary. Do you guys know what a formulary is? Sounds, it sounds official in British. So the British National Formulary. Uh, common or very common side effects include things like abdominal pain, anxiety, appetite changes, uh, constipation, depression, dry mouth, nausea, sleep disturbances. There's a number there. Obviously, sleep disturbances. That's the whole point of the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> headaches. There, there's a list of, of uh, common side effects. And then there were some uncommon side effects listed, too. And uh, it says the common ones occur in one out of 10 and between one in 10 and one in 100 administrations of the drug. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there that there has been at least some research on the topic of the side effects of modafinil and there's some data out there so that people will know, I guess, sort of what they're getting into. Have you ever experienced any of these? Um, trouble sleeping maybe, but I mean, even after like you come down, you're not like, it's not really a come down effect. It's just like your sleep might be a little less settled that night. Well, I like it because it's like more vivid dreams maybe, but mm. um, I just, when I read this, I couldn't help but like be an asshole and <laughs> uh, just think about like that. That So the list, you know, I tried only like a bridge to the list of side effects from it. Mm. I mean, here's the list of side effects from Bayer brand aspirin. Rash, gastrointestinal ulcerations, abdominal pain, upset stomach, heartburn, drowsiness, headache, cramping, nausea, gastritis, and bleeding. And... Uh, Black, bloody, or tarry stools. These are the rare ones, but he listed common then rare, mm -hmm. or they did. Uh, coughing up blood or vomit that looks like coffee grounds. Severe nausea, vomiting, stomach pain, fever lasting longer than three days. Swelling, pain lasting longer than ten days. Heart problems, ringing in your ears. Uh, upset stomach, heartburn, drowsiness, etc. Um, so I think I just I, I found that list of, of side effects super uncompelling because, that, I mean... If, you, if, if you're going to say a drug is safe, it's aspirin for the most part, right? When used responsibly. Yeah. That's sort of how I feel about modafinil. Yeah. That, yeah, the list of side effects is scary, but like some of those side effects for aspirin are horrifying. Mm -hmm. You know, coughing up things that look like coffee grounds, that sounds like you're dying and you probably are. <laughs> but that's super, super <laughs> rare, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> and these, I mean, these are ones that are supposedly common, but on the other hand, a lot of them seem like things that are sort of psychosomatic, you know, abdominal pain, dry mouth, headaches, that kind of stuff. They, they are things that I would be willing to attribute to other stuff because they're so wide ranging. It's not like consistently people who, who take this always get uh, nausea. It's just a large drowsiness. Drowsiness is a side effect of modafinil. Like, oh, 
I think everything that keeps you awake can also, in some people, make you sleepy and vice versa. Everything that makes you sleepy can, in some people, make you unable to sleep. <laughs> the one my, thing... My partner's mom has that reaction, the uh, the opposite reaction to, like, uh, whatever that drowsiness agent in Benadryl is. Mm. Uh, it wires her up like coffee. Mm. Interesting. So some people are backwards. But like, it's, like I said, half of those common ones overlap with the, uh, the common side effects from aspirin. Yeah. So I just... I mean, grain of salt... The one thing he did say that I thought may be uh, worth noting, and actually he used the words worth noting, it's worth noting that it seems to reduce the effectiveness of oral contraceptives, which is a kind of a big deal. That is a big yeah. deal, and I didn't know that, and that actually I'm glad it was pointed out, and that should be broadcast, or at least looked into and then broadcast. This, oh, was it? I think this was on the same episode still, where we were talking about uh, making people crap. Now I'm trying to get getting our episodes mixed up, but... Um, the one where we were talking about uh, raising people to new levels of doing better. Uh, Mr. Oliva says the marginal utility of rising to average is much higher in most cases than the marginal utility of becoming better than average. It's the difference between being independent and being very good at what you do. What do you guys think about that? Given that society is probably set up for the average case, mm -hmm. you probably are going to drop out of just standard functioning supported by society if you're below average, right? Yeah. So what on, Shelley said. Yeah. So on the personal level, probably there is huge marginal utility but to be able to get up to average, which is why people strongly support things to bring people up to average, but not so strongly support them to make them better than average. But that's, I think, like Shelley said, that, that's, that's just a byproduct of society being the way that it is. Yeah. Uh, that if like being below average is punished less or being above average is rewarded more or there was just like less pressure by the way everything's built up, like you need to have some level of i mean some a close to average level, level of cognition just to function in society mm -hmm. like to manage your budget or like go shopping those sorts of like you know day-to-day -day things yeah and a million other things those are two really lame examples mm -hmm. yeah i think once that's taken care of though then like getting bigger and better is the logical path forward and and desirable path forward yeah um i would say that you this really comes out when you talk about disability because like society is set up for people with certain mobility of um, capabilities and to drop below that would be because of the way society is, is set up a really big impact on your life. Whereas if you can actually walk faster, and, <laughs> right. Or you're really good runner, society is not really going to reward you for that unless you're a, like an Olympian or something. That's a really good point. Like if I couldn't walk, being able to walk would be a much bigger improvement than being able to walk three times as fast and three times as long as I currently can. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I basically agree absolutely on the individual level, but I kind of cheated um, on this by thinking about it a bit before I got here, since I knew <laughs> I was going to read it. <laughs> and uh, I think that on the societal level, it maybe flips because on soci society as a whole can support a certain amount of people who are below average, and it's not that big a deal. It doesn't drag society down that much. But the real progress that pushes us forward is done by the outliers, by like the super smart or super creative people that come up with the new drugs or the 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 Maxwell's equations governing electromagnetism or something like that. That the the frontiers that make us better and and push us to transhumanism are the really smart people. So maybe it would be the other way around, where it's more important to focus on that high end and try to get people over into that higher edge. Not for anyone's individual good, but for the aggregate societal development. I was going to say, as long as you don't like leave people behind, mm -hmm. but then I realized that that doesn't make any sense. Like if, you know, if we could, if we could bring on the advent of, you know, like a safe universe a hundred years quicker, if we lost a billion people now, even though like I'm, this is not something I'd advocate, that's the worst way to do it. Mm -hmm. But if that happened, it would be hard to say that that was the wrong thing, given how much suffering you prevented right mm. my my inner utilitarian caught up with me before i could mm. uh, <laughs> counter what you said but i also think that the fact that standout individuals can uh, advance science so much is a, a artifact of the the reality that we have science we have, we have an, an in scientific institution we have the infrastructure of society like could we could we do any I'm going to bring it back to agriculture, right? Okay. We have we have agriculture and we have like metal mines and you know all of that those little details are what allow these intellectual leaps to come to anything. 
imagine someone way back when who was a genius and like, what are they really going to be able to, what kind of, yeah. <laughs> what kind of advances are, can they achieve? Yeah. So you're saying yeah. that the, the benefit to pushing above and beyond like the average is only beneficial because like there's already an infrastructure in place to make that useful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's, yeah. there's an engine that can make use of it. And if you were to lose, if society were to collapse, would, would 10 geniuses be able to, Oh God, no, <laughs> no, the, the, the infrastructure is absolutely vital, but on the other hand, uh, I, I don't like what I'm about to say because it feeds into the whole capitalist narrative of humans are just units of production and are interchangeable. But if if the whole point of institutions is that they keep going on when the humans inside of them retire or die or whatever, so humans are somewhat replaceable when it comes to things like working the fields or working the mines. One one guy is just in terms of economic output almost as good as any other, whereas it's very hard to replace someone like uh, a Stephen Hawking or well not you know someone along on the leading edge right now. It's you can replace them, but there's a much smaller pool to choose from. I also don't see Shelley's point as like necessarily a counterpoint to the general position. It's just that it's a contingency that's worth keeping well, in mind, but I don't see it as like an argument against it. Yeah, maybe it's not like. A, a total argument against it, but just like the fact we we need we need that the average people to oh, yeah. be there for the in order for the <laughs> for the next twenty years till robots yeah. are doing all these jobs, right? <laughs> right? So like you mentioned, you know, the average guy is you know can pick fruit and dig dig mines better than you know as the same as the other average guy, but mm-hmm. you know robots will be outpacing us in that in the next few years, yeah. and then then and that's not uh, to devalue the average guy. I, no. I said before that. Every hero needs an entire support structure behind them. Without without the people there making the parts for his X-wing, Luke is just a guy swinging his dad's lightsaber around on a farm. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a really good way to put it. But it's also worth pointing out that like your self worth isn't tied up like in your production to capitalism or to like any job, right? Mm-hmm. It's easy to having come from six months of unemployment, I can totally relate that like, <laughs> God, I feel worthless right now. Uh, and I would like to think that if my jobs were like, if I lost my job to automation, I would, you know, have find some, and I, but I was still collecting paycheck or something. I could find meaning mm-hmm. and I probably could if I wasn't so worried about paying bills and stuff. So, uh, yeah. that's sort of an aside, but I didn't, well, I think I earlier, I made it sound like I was tying up people's self-worth with their production and I didn't mean to do that. So uh, I'm just going to go with M because emails are not public and I don't know if this person wants their name revealed. Uh, M says, it seems to me that the most effective cognitive booster is sleeping regular hours and exercise. That unless you're already doing that and really need more, it's a bad idea to move on to untested drugs. Someone mentioned that exercise was too time consuming, but I feel like they weren't considering the additional health benefits. Maybe if you're an astronaut, nootropics are a good idea since you got limited time in, in space. A limited time in space for your science stuff, and you're already operating on the edge of efficiency. And uh, yeah, I, I I think we did bring that up a few times. That really the best by far things you can do is get enough sleep and uh, get exercise. Those just have such ridiculously outsized effects that it's hard to compare them to anything else. But nootropics really are are sometimes you don't get enough sleep and you don't get enough exercise, and they're they're a way to cheat. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people who sleep and exercise and still drink coffee, mm. and coffee is nootropic by any measure. Mm. You make a good point. Like, and there's all kinds of other benefits to exercising. I don't think anyone's shitting on exercising. It is time consuming, but like, it's not just for the alertness factor. You have all the the awesome side effects of like living longer and feeling better all the time. Like mm-hmm. those things are make it worth the time, probably. Looking a bit better too. Oh yeah, it's a nice side effect. All right, I only have two things left. Uh, let's go with uh, the one from R. This was also from a private channel, so won't say their full name. I understand it's hard to keep up on topic with podcasting, airing delay, but getting back to repugnant conclusion. How long ago has we talked about the Republican? Really quick, I think this is an internet handle, and this person was a Patreon supporter. Okay. Uh, So I think we can say that their their handle was Roman. Okay. I don't know if they... I mean, that's not a whole lot of self-identifying information, but it's there. Thanks, Roman. We appreciate your contribution, and we're reading your question on the air. Yay! (laughs) I already had an argument with a friend about this, but it seems like a simplification error. You simplify the real world too much in order to draw this conclusion. Even if it seems perfectly reasonable, it doesn't mean that it can be applied to the real world. In reality, you can't have a society where everyone is of equal happiness, nor can you simply tell tell that someone is happy enough if he hasn't killed himself. (laughs) 
which is true. <laughs> Not only this person might be counted as unhappy, but he can also make a whole bunch of other people miserable. I've personally had the misfortune of encountering some pretty bad people and can't help but hold a very strong belief that the, if those people were to disappear, humanity's total utility would go up. And I think he actually has a really good point about that because it is a bit oversimplified to get to the point like where everyone is just above the level of having a life worth living and then you introduce another person and they will bring things down because happiness is not necessarily tied to how the resources are distributed and people do vary greatly in their happiness. There's probably people right now that would fall far below that, that line of, you know, wanting to keep existing necessarily. And so, yeah, to, to make it all flat and consider everyone even like that, I think makes the thought experiment a bit too simple, like thinking of a spherical cow. So I haven't actually read Derek Parfit's full version of that, mm -hmm. but I can only imagine that like the comeback to that would be something like, uh, well, you take an average. Right, an I average is just a nice point. Yeah, and but uh, I don't think the, the point of the 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 thought experiment was to get to the point where adding just a few more people makes everyone much more miserable, and so that is why we shouldn't add more people in the uh, in the more extreme conclusion when there's only like a million people around. Are you very familiar with Parfit's uh, repugnant conclusion? Um, I'm not not like an expert on it, but um. I would say that what one thing that you just said, Eniash, that resources don't directly translate to happiness, uh, is is important when you think about actually applying this to the real world, mm -hmm. because real human happiness actually is affected by the number of people around them, the number of people they get to interact with, the, the number f feeling like they're lost in a crowd, and feeling like there's so many of us people that. We're not noticed by maybe some people who are more powerful or whatever. I think you know, numbers of of communities and numbers of people that you are expected to take into account, but maybe you can't take that many people into account directly does affect human happiness in a way that doesn't directly translate to resources, as you said. And therefore, like, how could you, given that it's so, there's such this this feedback loop going on. How could you even calculate it if you try to make a practical implementation of this? Yeah. I think basically that last sentence, how can you calculate it if you're trying to make an implementation of this, is like you come back to like 50, 60 percent of like all moral thought experiments. <laughs> but I think the point, like it's less of like a this is an actualizable thing that we're trying to work towards uh, and more of like an intuition pump. And I think the point of Parfit's uh, uh, analysis of this is that like our like no matter what position you take, none of them work out well. So clearly we don't have a great picture of what we actually want and are trying to do. So I think, I think mainly it's less about like trying to prove this point that, you know, uh, this is, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it is overly oversimplified and confusing, but even the simplified version draws up these contradictions from like what our preferences are and what we're working towards. And so that's more what it's about. It's just that like, we don't have a coherent extrapolated volition when it comes to, like happiness levels and population. Well, I mean, I agree about that, but I think, I think that the thought experiment is so it has to map onto something that to make it make sense. It's not mapping onto anything. Well, it's uh, like the trolley problem. Well, it is just trying to say like if the, you had to choose between A and B, which would you choose to let to let let you ex investigate what what you really care about more, A or B? Yeah. Even though in the real world you probably won't have to choose between A and B. Right. Well, I mean, I think that makes total sense for things like the trolley problem where it actually maps onto things in reality. But with the with the um, the repugnant conclusion, like if one more person were to be born today, would they bring down or increase the total happiness? I mean, maybe. Depends on how happy they are. Exactly. So, maybe this, so that has absolutely nothing to do with how many resources. Well, not absolutely nothing, but they, right. It depends on how happy they are. If we're right at that level of, of subsistence, you introduce one more person, maybe they'll increase the happiness level because they'll be more happy than people in general. Or maybe right now where we have, I will uh, go out on a limb and say, a high amount of overall happiness in society, you introduce another person and they may drag down things instead of... instead of. You have a low amount of happiness in society. You think? Yes. Oh. I think it depends on how you phrase the question. Like, the most 
plentiful countries tend to be going to the highest suicide rates, yeah. which is counterintuitive. But I mean, we are enjoying pleasures that like our ancestors, you know, they spent their entire, they spent 16 hours a day tracking down lunch and dinner and, you know, hiding from tigers and shit. Like, and we're, our, our like downside is like, ah, my TV show got canceled. Like that is such an awesome problem to have. Like when our ancestors were scratching the dirt, trying not to die. But also they just didn't have time to think about whether or not they, sh their lives were a good thing to continue living or not. Right. They're so busy. They didn't think about it from the existential perspective. So. And now all this free time means that we have all the, we, we have time to reflect on that and come to the answer that like, Oh shit, it's pointless. Right. So I feel sorry for them because they didn't realize. <laughs> oh man. That's, I'm, I'm glad my ancestors didn't die. At least, you know, not before they did anyway. Um, so most of my ancestors are dead. Uh, I think I might have pointed this out when we were talking about Republican conclusion. It's been a while. But um, one of my favorite people, Will McCaskill, was on Sam Harris's podcast months ago, maybe a year ago. And he talked about this for 10, 15 minutes, and it was awesome. And so unless you want to, you know, dig up Parfait's essays, maybe maybe Roman read them and found them uncompelling. And if that's the case... Uh, I I want to come back to this once I've had a chance to get into it more, and okay. I will. You know what? Next episode we do. Do you want to do the repugnant conclusion and um, economics, like specifically how the capitalist system treats people right now? Because I've recently been reading up, not reading up on. I've been recently reading a blog that is making a very interesting argument, which has been changing my mind quite a bit over the last month, and I would like to talk about this. Yeah, well, earmark at that. That sounds fun. Okay, cool. But that said, I'm plugging Will McCaskill's uh, presence on Sam Harris's podcast, uh, Waking Up is the name of the show. Okay. I would check it out. Even whether or not you care about Parfit's repugnant conclusion, it was a great interview slash discussion. I will listen to that too. And, and I do want to say that the concept of a practical implementation that takes into account the repugnant conclusion could conceivably be a, a thing you need to start figuring out how to calculate uh, when, if there's like a, a friendly AI that's taking care of everything and you know need, needs to actually calculate people's happiness and determine how it's going to be affected by having more people yeah yeah which is another thing that ties into our transhumanism <laughs> which we're about to jump into possibly well you know what this other thing i can probably bring up next time so that's some of the listener feedback we've been meaning to get around to and have been too busy to do lately so sorry about that but thanks for your patience and I know we missed some other stuff, so we will definitely be on this more in the future. Yes. There, you know how a lot of people, you get into arguments with them and they're like, well, it's unnatural to extend the human lifespan and we all need to die and that's what gives life meaning <laughs> and all that. I have the exact opposite intuition on things. I feel that it almost... So this is coming from a religious background where I was literally told God created all people to live forever, which is why that is what we're going to get after Jesus comes back. <laughs> so this is at, at least influenced by crazy religious upbringing. But I get the intense impression that if you wanted to create a race of beings that would be very happy living forever, you would create something much like humans that are constantly changing and constantly growing and finding things that they used to do boring and finding new things exciting and who find richness in interacting with others and all the different permutations that can come from that. And also that forget things over time. So who you were like 70 years ago is a very different person from who you are right now, both due to changes in biology and just due to changes in circumstance and life experience. And it just seems like such a damn waste to kill someone off when they're 90 years old and they've just gotten started on everything. If, if you were to create a being that just could go on forever, it would be something like humans, that that's the kind of being that doesn't get bored. It doesn't eventually run out of things to experience because it's already experienced everything. It can come back to a guitar after three millennia and be like, oh yeah, this thing. Yeah, let's do this again because I forgot how to make it fun or how to make it sing. I think that's a really good point. I'd never heard it put that way before and I'm still unpacking it, but I guess I have one quick thought, which is that you mentioned like, you know, killing somebody at 90 mm -hmm. and I do feel like it'd be a different conversation if people lived on average to be a thousand. Mm -hmm. I don't think there'd be anyone arguing that, oh, they should die at 90. There, there are but some people that do. Not, I mean, you'd have far, not, far not fewer. Yeah, not specifically we should kill people that make it to 90, but along the lines of, you know, four score and 10 is as much as any human really should have and after that shuffle along and make room for the new generations and also that it would make your life meaningless if you just kept living 
I think I think people only say that because that happens to be ripe old age right now. Yes, I agree completely. Yeah. So like if if like just if our ancestors lived to be a thousand, and that was how long everyone lived, yeah. then they'd be saying a hundred score yeah. instead, right? So well, or um, like, how much is a score? Twenty. Yeah. Oh, then whatever. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like that scene where Dumbledore was like, "Yeah, but I wouldn't want to outlive my two hundred eighty years, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Who wants to live longer than that?" <laughs> right. Um, the other thing is that you mentioned that some people say it's unnatural. I don't know what you mean by that word, or what you think they mean by that word. Uh, I think what they implicitly mean even though they haven't thought about it is that it is how long people live right now i guess why is what's natural uh like what's wrong with doing something natural then not my word i mean <laughs> if you had to the, 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 i just that's not what's uncomfortable to them like there oh. were people who said organ plants plant organ transplants are unnatural when that was first introduced they're super unnatural the <laughs> idea that like i could be walking around with someone else's heart pumping my blood is yeah really weird yeah but i don't think it's bad right i think people have a an intuition, uh, a Chesterton's fence intuition that maybe they couldn't explain as well as Chesterton did. Do we want to quickly cover what Chesterton's fence is? Probably. Would you like to do the honors? Uh, if you come across a, a fence out in the open and you don't, don't know why this fence is there, and you're like, well, since I don't know what it's for, I'm going to get rid of it, then you realize that it had a purpose. Um, like so, you get you get gored by a, a bull and right. you're like, oh, it's keeping the bull away from yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is that you it's you can remove the fence, but only once you actually know what, why it was put there in the first place. And yeah, to say like, I don't see the purpose of this. Let's get rid of it is is not wise. Yeah. So I mean, like the reason that the Chesterton fence is there. I don't know if that's the right use for that. On like when we die is because our cells run out of like the ability to duplicate reliably. Right. And um, that's like, I mean, there's, I think not, a, there's mis- not really a why behind Yeah, that. I think they're misapplying the concept, but it is that intuition that yes. you shouldn't change things. It, it, and there's a sense of like people have an intuition of uh, being designed, right, by some creator, right? Or And even if they don't specifically believe in that, there's still this weird intuition a lot of people have about uh, evolution being in some sense purposeful, right? And then so there'd be like, if we lived for much longer than we do, then there'd be all these unforeseen things that we evolved we like neatly and and usefully evolved to avoid all those terrible things and now we have to deal with them and we don't even know what they are that's fair so yeah even if you're not running with like the, the god made purpose the people have this intuition that things aren't the way they are for no reason right and so we should figure out what those reasons are before we start fucking with things is yeah. that i guess i can see that but i mean a i'm much more willing to quickly swallow that pill of things are the way they are for basically no reason or at least no good reason especially stupid biological things yeah those are all i mean the, the reason for those i think are pretty well understood and they're not i don't think there's any like moral backing to them right yeah. i'm also not super convinced just by the idea that like because something is unnatural means that it's bad i think my favorite one version of that that i heard of like what natural means is like using something for its intended purpose and in that sense like homosexuality was unnatural mm-hmm. Because you're not using your pub- your reproductive organs for the way that evolution or God intended, <laughs> um, but then I'm like the the best comeback to that is like is opening a beer bottle with a hammer like morally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I mean, it might not be the best use of a hammer or the best way to open a beer bottle, but if it gets the job done, like right. it's not morally wrong like there i don't think that they may say that you are degrading the beer bottle and the hammer but it's much worse <laughs> like it doesn't matter to degrade objects but degrading your own body is, is something that matters it's my own fucking body <laughs> that's sort of my comeback it's like, don't you to be telling me what to do yeah. <laughs> my my bottle and hammer oh, something oh. something i'm right. <laughs> <laughs> not gonna dive into that <laughs> kind of reminds me of a feedback we got, uh, which I didn't get to, but I think it was also by Mr. Oliva saying that he's mainly um, against things like uh, performance enhancing drugs for kids because it would be like a barbaric Roman gladiator sort of thing to see people just smashing into each other and destroying themselves. <sighs> and I'm like, yes, but on the other hand, it's when it's a kid, then obviously that's a bad thing. But it's our own bodies. We can do what we want to them. People are regularly th- risking their bodies doing things like driving in in sports races or or mining or anything you do that risk has some risk of danger to you it's your choice it's your body you know use it up how you see fit yeah i mean those are different situations the one with the kids and doing it yourself yeah. but i'm also like i could spend 10 years working out to become like as athletic as an olympian mm-hmm. or if i could do it in two years with drugs 
it's hard for me to see like as long as there's no serious drawbacks why one's better than the other mm -hmm. well the thing is that there often are serious drawbacks but and yet there are perverse incentives that that motivate people to to value to, to be willing to sacrifice their health for an olympic medal or whatever it is yeah if if there were no like physical side effects to to taking those huge making drugs but people did get torn up on the out on the playing field doing this for our entertainment is that is that still wrong in some sense like there was that huge hout cry about um the concussions that nfl football players suffer and they're still playing football they are like, still so playing I mean, football but they have changed the rules a little bit to make the concussions uh to what? take that into account i mean boxers are still wearing gloves and you know ruining their lives too yeah. like in fact you met uh, muhammad ali right i did and you met muhammad ali i did i, I get the, oh, i get the impression that he probably would have been a healthier old person and an older old person well, if he hadn't boxed his whole life P parkinson's might have been linked yeah, to his tr you know repeated traumatic brain injuries uh, yeah i guess i don't know that much about the utla of, of parkinson's uh, how was he when you met him was he still functional uh he couldn't speak oh. um yeah I didn't mean to like name drop for you, but I remember <laughs> that that was interesting. And it was, I always think of like boxers when I think, I mean, football, cause yeah, they've tried, you know, better padding, changed rules and stuff, but boxing or like really any fighting, uh, that's, I mean, head partly, trauma is the point. Yeah. It's partly like their for their glory, but it's like, it's only glory for glor gloryful, glorifying for them because yeah. it's fun for us. Right. Yeah. I don't actually watch professional fighting, but, Me uh, like for some people it's a lot of fun and that's why they get glory out of it. Yeah. If everyone thought it was barbaric and gross, they wouldn't fewer people would do it. Yeah. And even in the Roman times, most gladiators were uh people who wanted to be gladiators because it brought a lot of glory and money and you had rich ladies coming over and wanting to sleep with you cuz fuck yeah, you just tore some shit up in the gladiator arena. And it probably beat other kinds of being a slave. It was so, what it probably beat other kinds of slavery, <laughs> right? So, right. So that's, that's one of the perverse incentives that <laughs> that lead people to do things like that. Like your life is going to be pretty shitty, so why not go out in a blaze of glory? Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and drop stars, uh, the TV show network uh, version of Spartacus. Very fun, yeah. Gladiators. <laughs> but we can all agree we don't want to have modern gladiator arenas, right? Where people kill each other for the glory and our entertainment. I mean, do we want to tell people what they can do with their bodies, Inyash? I thought we just settled on that. That's what I'm bringing up just now. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'd be I'd be okay with it if people really were t free and didn't have these, you know, pressures coercing them into it. Oh. If people like made that choice in a vacuum of some some sort, gotcha. if they then, didn't need the money to feed their family, yeah, or, or yeah. I mean, I don't know how you'd remove all those incentives and have it still be a desirable thing to do, like. I'm sure like playing football is fun for people, but it's also fun because they like people watching and cheering their name and stuff. And like, I don't know if that incentive is perverse or not. Let's imagine the, the transhumanist future where some people decide to uh, tell the AI to, to build some kind of risk of death into their, their activities. Mm -hmm. And maybe they do it for the sake of an audience mm -hmm. as well. A, a common thing to find in transhumanist fiction is that sort of uh, risky play. Um, in every novel that I've read, society has basically shrugged and said, okay, I'm not sure if that's a realistic depiction of how things would And go. I would hope that the people who do that and the people who like to watch that could be like in a totally different part of reality than me so I wouldn't have to talk to them. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, be, not why, talking. Why? Because like you would be sad or? Yeah, it's just kind of like, oh, you like that. Well, I'm going to be over here. Oh. <laughs> would you try to stop them? No, I'd be like, that's that's your deal. And also your personality is distasteful to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm in your camp, but I'm also just here, like contemplating this for the first time. So like the idea is that they would uh, like do the same crazy fun stuff that all of us want to do, but they'd like delete all their backups first. <laughs> and then film themselves or something, right? Mm -hmm. Like, is that what sort of you're imagining? Well, that's that's a good enough. That's close enough. Again, part of me is like, well, do whatever you want. But I, I would also think that they've got some serious priority issues if they care more about, like, the applause of the crowd than, like, living till tomorrow. But maybe they also have some... They're doing it partially for themselves, I bet. I bet the, the thrill of I could actually die is is part of it. And then also the audience is also another part of it. There is some risky behavior that I'm attracted to purely because it is risky. 
and that's perverse, and your personality is distasteful to me. <laughs> Whoa. Aww. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a pretty low-risk guy, so I, that none of that appeals to me or even really makes intuitive sense. I am for the most part, but there's just one or two things that it's like, oh, this is going to be fun. Okay. <laughs> You've got to lost at least one of them. Mm, no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> I thought that might work. <laughs> so... I mean, I don't have a good answer to that. That's that's an interesting thing to consider. I'm sort of at a loss. Uh, well, this kind of brings up uh, the the issue, and there was a whole article about it in the fun sequences, uh, fun theory sequences, and I wish I had read it more recently so I could report what it actually said. But it was about um, dangerous options. I'm not sure what the, the, the title was something similar to, to dangerous options, but it wasn't that. But the idea that... Uh, in the future, we should not allow every op- conceivable, like doable option, to be available to people because because they'll screw themselves, and we should somehow like nanny them out of it. <laughs> I'm sort of in favor of. I don't know. I need to give this some more thought. I tend to be when I'm first exposed to an idea, I tend to just agree with whatever the first thing I hear is. So <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to. That's something I'm actually working on is to to correct that and just hold, reserve my position. Yeah. I can see the benefits to that position. I can see why mm-hmm. some people would find it compelling. That's as much as I'm willing to say right now. I think I strongly disagree with that. Yeah. I, I'm reminded of the metamorphosis of prime intellect, which is available free online, and it it follows someone who is. They're just a legitimately crappy person. They're they're mean. They hurt other people, and they are very masochistic as well. They mm-hmm. hurt themselves a lot, and they're upset that they are in a reality that is run by an evolent AI that won't let them kill themselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, I, she's the protagonist that you're talking about. Yes, right? yes, she's okay. the protagonist. I don't remember her being that mean. I remember her being very masochistic, and in some some instances. Re- vindictive yeah it's it's very hard to be terribly mean in that world because you can't hurt people if they don't agree to it but also she seemed to care about people yeah but she was extremely self-destructive yeah and i Mm -hmm. i feel like the story was meant a sort of an extreme outlier as if someone was this self-destructive and hell-bent on on hurting themselves should we stop them and i think i kind of come down on the on the point of view that I think the author was advocating uh, that, no, go ahead and let them hurt themselves. It's their body and their choice. They're, um, they're an adult. I think the point of that story was actually something else. It was to raise the question of whether people's lives should at all be, be d- d- safe. You should even have the option of a safe life. I think you should have the option. Because remember, this protagonist destroy the AI and return to everyone to uh, like prehistoric technological level. Spoiler First, alert. spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> Second, I disagree. <laughs> I don't think that happened. I, I, I think that the AI allowed her to think that uh, that's what she did and created a special simulation just for her where she could go ahead and be as self-destructive as she wanted after that. I haven't read the story, but I like your version because it means that the AI is thinking at one level higher than this person. <laughs> right. That's... that's and awesome. That's what I want for my super intelligent agent. But then agent. The, the last chapter was from the perspective of a child of the protagonist. Which, if you're going to actually give someone that level of freedom, you kind of have to let them have children as well, right? No. Like, if you're going to get to go to the point of, of uh, tricking them into thinking that this is reality, why not trick them to, to thinking they have kids also? And, and rather than condemning a non-consenting person to live in that reality. Yeah. I want to ask a clarifying question. How did this person end up in this uh, this world? Were they just born into it, like an average person, or no? They were uh, they were dying uh, as of terminal cancer, as like very old age. They, they when lived the, through the singularity. Yeah, the AI basically took control as they were dying and saved her, but she'd lived for many years in constant pain. Interesting. Okay, well, I could say that makes someone bitter. And then once she was in the perfect world, she hated how perfect it was. Mm-hmm. She said there's no meaning to life if you don't have anything to struggle and you could, there's no fear of destruction. Yeah. Okay. Which so they, I disagree they did a good with. Job of setting that up. I was going to say, like, it sounds to me that the AI that put this world together did a bad job in letting people in of that predisposition. Oh, I see. But they just brought in already existent people mm-hmm. of, whatever disposition, of whatever disposition they were and had some imperative against, like, changing them as people, mm-hmm. which is probably a safe bet. Okay. Well, they, they covered that already, I guess. That's... 
a good point. Yeah, so I tend to believe that it actually did happen because otherwise, why is there this person whose perspective we are now seeing through who is the child of her? Hmm. I see your point. <laughs> I still like my interpretation. Well, that would be nicer. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> So, so the real question that we're trying to figure out is like... Sh should we nanny people away from things they may, might do to themselves? For instance, I would make my memory perfect and I would not be one of those humans that you described that forget things over time. Oh, really? But should I be prevented from this? What if I remember every person I've ever been friends with and then as time goes on, I get bored with being friends with each of them and I eventually become friends with everyone. And then there's no new people for me to be friends with. But then we have to create new people. But then we have to calculate if we're approaching a repugnant conclusion. Mm -hmm. So I can stop there at like the second <laughs> part of that, 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 that ladder, though, that you, you would be friends with everybody. You might have met everybody. Mm -hmm. But by the time you made friends with the one billionth person, the first mm -hmm. person would be very different. Right. right, so like you can't maintain perfect relationships with a billion people at once. Mm. Maybe you can in the transhumanist future. Yeah, you can make all... lots of clones of yourself and reintegrate your memory. Or you could even just have telepathic conversations with a thousand people at a time. Mm. Right, you don't need to be like separate minds or, or separate. At that clones. point, are you even human anymore? <laughs> well, you're transhuman. That's the point. Oh yeah, good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are human brains safe for multi-threading? Um, Probably make it safe. Yeah. Should we not be allowed to do <laughs> extreme <laughs> multi-threading? There's some big questions, guys. I mm. uh, <laughs> should have thought of these before I got here. I should have known what we were talking about before I got here. Whenever we get into the question of should we be allowed to do the thing, my, I almost always default to... Yeah, we should. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you should. Unless you're hurting someone else and then only with their consent. I mean, I'm also sort of in favor of nannying, though. Like, I mean, we, we used kids as an example of, like, modern humans last time. And, I mean... You nanny your kids out of the road because there's cars. It would be nice if nature or some huge force could nanny us away from the edge of metaphorical cliffs or whatever, super dangerous things. Like, is it nannying to, like, remove heroin from the earth or, yes. you know, other things like that? But is that a bad thing? Or, like, pick something worse than heroin. Pick whatever, you know, crazy drug X or, like... Well, things that, that I would argue that drug addictions in a, in a significant way actually decrease your autonomy... So it's kind of hard to say, like, it's a violation of your autonomy to not allow me to destroy my own autonomy, you know? Those those things could fall into a special... But if it's what you want, area. I mean, that 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 kind of go. We even have some of that today in the in the realms of kink, like the people who like to be 24-7 subs. That they have willingly given away a certain bit of their autonomy, but they like that. Um, I, this is a totally different topic, but I'm going to say that they are... Uh, formally claiming to have given away their autonomy. Oh, I see. But it's not legally enforceable. Well, well, so they still laws have... Laws are no laws. Like, <laughs> they haven't, like, created... A, their minds are still capable of making decisions, and they're still morally responsible for their own acts. Right. They haven't, like, literally... What do you call it when you lance out a part of the brain? Yeah. Uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, lobotomy thank you lobotomized <laughs> themselves and it's harder than l um yeah so maybe in in the case that you brought up these people consented and are like you said formally uh yeah. forfeited their their freedoms but like it's not like i'm assuming i would hope that if they woke up tuesday morning next week and they're like i'm kind of done with this like no one's like nope sorry you're here for life like then that's where it starts becoming a wrong yeah. thing to do yeah. right so like, they haven't really given up their freedom any more than anybody who volunteers to go into a cave for eight years that's very different than like being shoved in solitary confinement in prison for eight years right yeah i i mean i'm, I'm brought back to I, I know i reference fiction a lot i'm sorry because this, this is terrible and i feel <laughs> like your brain is made out of how dare yeah. you be well read jesus <laughs> i don't know i just it feels it feels i i don't know anyways you can't Getting refer to, to an point. actual experience because you don't have any. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, but again, The Golden Age by John C. Wright, who nowadays is a crazy man, and even back then was a crazy man, but this book is really good. There is a character in it, for certain definitions of good, there, there's a character in it who experiences life from a different perspective that is so amazing, he cannot imagine going back to his own real life anymore. And so he just puts himself in that simulation where he's living this other life again and erases his memories that he ever uh, was the other person. But the simulation isn't 
free. It's very cheap, but it still costs some money to run. And he eventually starts running low on money. And so he uh, he gets pulled out of the simulation by the AI and being like, hey, you're running low on money. We're going to have to return you to real life so you can make some money. <laughs> He's like, uh, no, you know what? Make the simulation cheaper. Make it run slower. Uh, make there be, and after a month pulled out, hey, you're running low on money again. Okay, make it so that the colors are more muted and there isn't as much vibrancy in sound. And <sighs> erase the parts of my brain that would notice that. <sighs> and then a little, you know, a few years after that, pulled back out. He's like, make everything black and white. Make, do no, long, no longer render things in 3D. Make everything 2D <laughs> and delete the parts of my brain that would notice <laughs> that's a weird thing. And eventually is living this impoverished, like, existence where he is still in his mind, like, living the ultimate best life as this wonderful person. But in reality, it is this flat black and white, almost no sound sort of hell. He gradually tricked himself into wireheading. Yeah. Whereas maybe he wouldn't have chosen that at the beginning. Yeah. But over, over these steps, he, he got himself into that point. I love that's the trend of like half the the things you have, the stories you bring up that like, Oh, that sounds great at the beginning. And then it's like, <laughs> Oh yeah. But then this, then like this, terrible daisy center thing happens and then it gets awful i'm like oh fuck <laughs> it's, it's hard to say like where to draw the line like i'd be okay like losing i don't know rendering objects that i can't see mm-hmm. like that sounds like an like an obvious yeah. thing to, to you know yeah why are you wasting resources on that but then you know where do you draw the line do you draw it at color at 3d <laughs> <laughs> yeah but is that a thing that it should be not legal for him to do i don't know man mm. I'm kind of hoping, like, maybe I should have said that an hour ago. Like, I don't know. And I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to say that I don't have a good answer to that. Like, I, I'm prepared to say that if people no longer want to live, they should be allowed to kill themselves. Be like, eh, I've done everything I want to do, and I'm not lo- no longer getting enjoyment in life. Please terminate my processes now. I think it depends on why you want to kill yourself, for sure. Yeah. Like, if you want to kill yourself because of a problem that's easily correctable, mm-hmm. then, you know, no, we're going to just go ahead and help you through this problem that you're having. And then if you still want to, we can talk about it, you know? Like, but you know how you could sort of trick people out of that? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you could say, okay, we'll let you die, but will you agree to, in your will, bequeath us a full copy of your memories? And uh, once they do, you just create a similar personality to theirs, except that what doesn't want to die and have put in all the memories. <laughs> it probably only work once. Then after that, people are like, I saw what you did to the last person that wanted to die. I'm also pretty sure that'd be violating their wishes, but it's hard to see, like, well, your wishes like are to not exist. If we want to make a, just a slightly better and different version of you exist, like, yeah. what harm is it to you? None. No. You're dead. So. And they, they agreed to give you their memories. Yeah, if they agreed. I don't know. I, it seems like a violation. I, I think if, I feel like our intuitions aren't great at grasping questions like this. Yeah. And that these aren't like problems that we can like maybe you guys have thought about them for longer than I have for the most part I sort of just like hope things won't suck in the future and (laughs) I guess yeah hope I could check out if things did suck Um, but I'm kind of hoping that either really smart generations you know uh, generations worth of smart humans have have worked out a good solution to these problems or you know in an afternoon a super intelligence did for us right (laughs) and uh, then, then we won't have all these weird quandaries. Be like, you know what? This is actually your CEV. This is you, this will work out great. This is humanity's CEV, right? Mm-hmm. I don't have good intuitions on a lot of these questions. I feel like that's something I should have said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Since you brought up CEV, c- coherent extrapolated volition, uh, I could be wrong, but I feel like this notion is somewhat strongly tied to another notion of the psychological unity of humankind. And in mm-hmm. fact, that's an article by Eliezer called the psychological unity of humankind. Mm-hmm. How, how do you feel about that? Do you think humankind is as psychologically unified as he says? No. And in fact, uh, there was a counterpoint article written by Kai Satala, okay. um, which was called the psychological something else (laughs) disunity something like that Uh, right um and that one was more convincing to me i don't suppose you could lay it out i think i it's been a while since i've read i might have actually read that other one too but i Mm -hmm. remember i think the vague outline of of eliezer's point which was like we all have the same underlying brain architecture like one human's possible range of experiences can't be that different from any others because we all run in the same substrate we all have the same meat Mm -hmm. or we all have indistinguishably similar meat I think the phrase that I like is that we're, you know, same model of cars with different color paint. Like there's under the hood, we're exactly the same. 
I get that like the hardware and software are two very different things. Mm, that's actually, I guess, when you run down that path, like like you mentioned, AA works for people of certain mental architectures. I mean, you can make a mental architecture where someone's super happy mutilating their their six year old daughter, right? Ooh. Like, so I mean, that's somebody's lived experience probably on Earth yeah. right now. So. I'm sort of of the opinion that like that's not what they would want if they had a sampling of better experiences and better architectures. Like if they could try other things out, they mm. would have realized like, oh yeah, that was a pretty fucked up way to do stuff. I might be wrong. Well, um, I'm just gonna read the last sentence of the of Eliezer's article. Um, before the, the article talks about evolution and why like evolution is the reason for this, um, and specifically sexual reproduction. And then, so this last sentence is, having been born of sexuality, we must all be very nearly clones. Because hmm. that's how that works. But some things that are pointed out in Kai Satala's article were that, um, yes, we should all have the this machinery um, in our genes, but it's very easy, even after you have evolved a complex uh, structure, to just, with one tiny mutation, turn off that whole com complex thing. That was evolved or to just dial it down and is the author suggesting that that happens regularly with populations of humans um well he, they made an analogy to dogs and dog breeds and how uh, um domestication of dogs from wolves has has happened in a very short amount of time and so that the argument that humans haven't had enough time to become that uh diverse doesn't really hold up when you think about dogs and uh, you know, compared to other evolutionary things. Man, I, I'm convinced that I could make people dislike that entire position by pointing out some of the possibly repugnant implications of that line of thinking, even though like that, that wouldn't necessarily, that wouldn't actually disprove it, but it sounds so politically incorrect to say that mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, you can make people's behaviors different. But then it turns out that like some isolated groups of humans are like less smart than other, other groups of humans or like traits that we actually care about are less prominent in some of these places, right? But I don't feel it's that controversial to say that, uh, like, introversion and extroversion can be largely determined f genetically, like, things like that. I mean, um, maybe. Like, but there's a lot of kickback to the idea that, like, things like intelligence or even, like, I think there's less kickback because it's so obvious, but, like, your uh, sort of, like, baseline happiness level is pretty pretty strongly mm -hmm. genetic mm -hmm. and that's sort of a bummer but it's hard for me to see like why things like intelligence wouldn't be also heritable to some strong in fact all the evidence a lot of evidence says that it is to large yeah. degrees i, I i'm but not that's... sure exactly okay so i do know sort of who you're quoting about that but as far from what i've heard and i'm not a person who hangs out in these uh biological intellectual circles so this is hearsay but from what i've heard basically everyone in the field says things along the lines of yes intelligence is at least partially heritable and it varies among groups the idea that it varies among groups is very politically incorrect okay and therefore like denied as a fact by a lot of people okay and i think that to say that oh yeah some people you know if we're if some humans populations are as distinct as uh like chihuahuas and great danes to take the dog analogy right. Uh, it's hard to say that like some groups of people would have, uh, like, like, I guess all the capacities that we care about as people and feel are important, uh, that those would, that those would remain magically untouched. Right. Right. But I mean, again, I'm not really making that this point actually invalidates that argument. I mean, I'm just saying that, that I feel like I could make a dark arts argument that would convince some people. Clearly humans are not as different as dog breeds, but, um, it just shows that we could be different enough to have different values and that maybe even if you try really hard you couldn't find a cev between everyone on the planet i have a hard time believing that even people who are closely related to me would necessarily have a cev with me i i'm i'm quite sure that there are people who really find a lot of uh i, I want to say almost um moral uh righteousness and certain definitely uh, a feeling of this is the way things should be that uh people who are able to physically dominate should do so that that and i it's often part of you know the more risk behavior driven type of person 
that uh, that these are the way things should should be run. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if they would ever have the same CEV as others as people who are more egalitarian and more like chill and everyone should live together like we tend to be. And by we, I mean the three of us in this room. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have, I think part of my intuition for this, and this, maybe this will strip away the deeper you get, but like, oh, look at this. This person, you know, cares a lot more about like praying and self-sacrifice, whereas this person cares more about like uh, reading and going to school or something, right? Like very different goals. Mm -hmm. What do they really care about? Like they care about being the best person that they think they can be and maximizing their path towards that. Or like maybe a better example would be... Well, being the best person you can be is a very different thing for a Marine in the Army and for a programmer in Silicon Valley. Not really. I mean, they both like, these are the kinds of things I want to do. I'm going to do what it takes to get really good at them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they, I guess... A Marine that, would that, want to... So like the value of like trying to become the best you you can be... I don't think that their value, like their core values are that different in those two cases. Maybe uh, one really doesn't want to kill people and one really does. But <laughs> why, I mean, that's, that's kind of a core value. Well, so that's, that's what I was going to pick at. Like, I don't think that, I mean, aside from, I think anomalies, people don't, a lot of people don't want to kill people. They're just ready to, or they, they have like a threshold of like, okay, I'm gonna put my life on the line to protect myself and those I care about. That's way lower than other people's. I think right? they would also want to see different, uh, different society, societal structures. I think one of those people would be much more on board with the let people do anything they want. It's their body argument. And other types would be more along the lines of, no, that's stupid. You don't let someone turn their life into a two-dimensional black and white hellscape that they think they enjoy. You step in and you stop them regardless of what they want. So why do those two people disagree? I'm asking that like, as a real question. I think it's... I, I'm interested in hearing your answers before Maybe I throw up my person, own thoughts. Maybe one person values autonomy more and the other person values someone being around to be happy in the way that I think humans should be happy more. So I think it'd be easier if we picked an example that wasn't all the way to like, you know, the the, the sci-fi example you read. We can pick two plausible current humans or current human positions. Like, Well, Inuyash and, Inuyash and I have a, a maybe a fundamental value difference in that uh, you want to see the future still have some chance of disaster that humans need to take care of and not leave it to the, the AI, right? Mm -hmm. You need... I would I would not want a to be a nanny race or not a nanny race, but what is the opposite of nanny? You, you want nannied. To, <laughs> nannied, yes. You want to to have some portion of the survival of the species depend on members of the species or something like that. Not necessarily. It has to depend on members of the species, but I guess that I sort of what it boils down to that there is there is no parent figure that fixes everything for us. That it is that we are still important in some fundamental way. Are we important now? I'm not trying to be an asshole. I'm just, I, uh, I, mean, I feel it, like I say that too much that like, maybe I am an asshole. If I'm, if no, I'm making no, that qualifier no, no. a lot. <laughs> you, I, I think you're more used to hanging around the same sorts of people that would require that, uh, that caveat as opposed to like, we don't need that caveat. We both know you and we like to talk about this sort of thing anyway. Fair enough. Yeah. I, I always need that caveat. <laughs> So keep saying that when I it tell shows. you what I'll say I'm being an asshole yes. when I, next time I feel like I'm being an or like if I'm trying to be an <laughs> asshole. Yeah, yeah. So why I mean are humans important in the way that you care about now? As far as I can tell there is no greater power so if if we want to get off this planet and and colonize the stars that's up to us. So and so you, in that even, regard you even yes. want a super intelligence help us build better rockets. I, you know, I don't mind the concept of being helped by things. We're helped by a lot of things. We're helped by dogs to keep ourselves sane, you know? Uh, we're helped by machines to build buildings. But um, if someone were to take over completely and just allow us to play in the corner where it's safe, that's different than than actually being able to have some measure of control over oh, our destiny. So it's not necessarily that the AI saves us from from meteors, you know, destroying everything on our planet, but rather that uh it can do like it we don't actually have the power if it was if it was really a super intelligence, we wouldn't really have the power to to do anything that it couldn't do. Yeah, I think it's more like a bodily autonomy taken to a uh like social level where 
if we are not in ultimate control of our destiny. The AI decides uh, whether or not this asteroid goes here and and we don't. So it, does it just matter to you that it's humans or any particular human? Like, I don't have ultimate destiny over not, like, nukes get launched tonight, right? Mm -hmm. So, or whether or not, like, like if, if there wasn't an asteroid coming and NASA did have plans to actually take care of it, I wouldn't be in charge of that. But right. is it important to you that just humanity is? Sort of, which is also weird because I understand that going forward, we're not going to be human anymore. We're going to be transhuman. So it's not like I'm necessarily married to the idea of a squishy meat bag being in control of things. But I think it's the difference between like if I were to live another hundred years and become the person that I am in a hundred years, there's a continuity there. Whereas if who I am right now was replaced tomorrow morning by the me from a hundred years ago, that would not feel like the same sort of process. Well, and that's answering a different question, though, I think. I mean, Stephen, do you think that? <laughs> you meant 100 years from now, not 100 years ago, right? Yes. Did I say 100 years ago? Yeah. I was I, just checking. Sorry. I'm I, I saw what you're getting at, though. I mean, is that, I hate to like always, you know, with thought experiments, like pick either or, but would you rather die than just be replaced by you from 100 years from now tomorrow morning? I mean, I would say that I had died. Would you say that you died completely? I mean, there's some semblance of you. You and 100 years from now would still have some of your memories, you know, care about some of the things you still care about. If I went back and I took the place of 19-year-old me, I would feel like I had killed the person who existed between 19 and now. I Maybe this is a failure of my imagination, but I'm imagining that me in 50 years will be more similar to me now than me now is to me of 15 years ago. Yeah, but 15 years ago, you were still a kid. Well, I you, mean, you 19, you were still basically a kid. Yeah, but once you get past puberty, you don't change quite as quickly. Like 15 years ago for you right now is a huge difference, whereas 15 years from you now is not going to be as huge of a difference. I said 50. Oh, you said 50? Yeah, in the future. So okay. like even if you were, or 150 even, mm -hmm. I think I'll be more similar to myself in 150 years from now than I was to myself 15 years ago. Okay. Well, I'll be bigger. It'll be hard to compare the two. I mean, but uh, I guess I'm still trying to figure out exactly what the, the issue is with your nanny uh like the the nanny version of a like of a. I, I would like to mention Eniash that you could murder me right now. No, I couldn't. <laughs> that I would mean, be that would be wrong. I mean, physically, <laughs> you could murder me right now, and there's nothing I could do about it. People, you'd be punished after the fact, and I could tell you, like, threaten you with punishment after the fact, but I couldn't actually physically stop you if you had decided that was a good thing to do. I mean, you might be able to. Things are never 100%. You're making a good argument in favor of private gun ownership. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, just going to say. You could just kind of like move out of the way and trip me. I couldn't possibly fall down the stairs, you know? <laughs> I mean, it is very unlikely that I could prevent you from murdering me right now. Like if you're suddenly bloodlusted. I, I, I don't think want, to, I don't want to think about me murdering anyone. This is not a comfortable <laughs> And thought. I still feel like the fact that you are so much more capable of murdering me <laughs> than I am of mur murdering you or whatever, okay. right? That doesn't, doesn't necessarily uh, reduce my autonomy, just the fact that you have this power, yeah. right? Like you using it would, would reduce my autonomy. Yeah. But the, just the fact that you have it is, you know? I mean, so like, pretend I'm bigger and stronger than you are, and for whatever reason, like, I'm trying to think of some ridiculous example where like something's falling and I'm able to catch it mm -hmm. like a, like if I was Spider-Man and mm -hmm. someone threw a bus at us and I could catch it and yeah. you would die if I didn't. Yeah. Would yeah. that take away your autonomy for me to catch that, no, catch that bus? No, I'd be happy that you did that. <laughs> but <laughs> So you extrapolate but, to a meteor. Yeah. It's like if the thing gets bigger. Then yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> but if you were like Uber Spider-Man who got to see the entire course of my life and decide whenever I think, whenever you think I'm doing something too stupid not to allow me to do that, and and make sure that everything that I decide to do is safe enough that I'm okay, that you're okay letting me do that thing, I would have some sort of qualms about that. That's a big difference from what you are saying earlier about, like, wanting humans in charge of keeping humanity alive. Right, right? well, so I mean, like, that's because it was, it, it's hard to, it's hard to explain, I guess, and I needed this metaphor to help me with that. Like, it's not just that I don't want an AI's help if an asteroid is coming to hit Earth. Fuck yeah, I do, but more along the lines of the AI is the only thing that matters and make sure that we only do the things that are okay and within our sandbox of safety. Okay, I think you've changed yeah. a little bit because okay. you've definitely before said that you wanted humans to stop the asteroid. Whether on this episode or the last one, I can't remember. Okay. And so... Yeah, the last one. Uh, there's, there's a distinction there, right? Yeah. 
I'm I do find Spider Man saving me. Uh, you're right. <laughs> but you're right. If Spider Man was following me around all the time, <laughs> like <laughs> making sure that I made all the right choices. And like, Stephen, do you really want Lucky Charms for breakfast? Like, that's not the kind of Spider Man I want in my life. Right? And man, these these conversations become a lot more fun when you play super intelligent <laughs> Spider Man. <laughs> should we just call him Spider Man from we now on? From now on, rationalist taboo. AIs are actually Spider Man. <laughs> But I was really attached to the I imagining it as Machine Doggo. Okay. <laughs> he, he says things like, Hi, human. We are friends. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure you want to kill yourself today? <laughs> right. Dogs don't want you to do that. No. <laughs> I'm reminded a little bit of when he mentioned Machine Doggo. What was that story that you linked to a couple weeks ago on Facebook? Utopia Lol? Yes. Oh, my God. That oh. was a fun story. <laughs> that was. I found it actually kind of, like you mentioned, it was kind of a roller coaster. I, like at first, it's just slapstick fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then you get into it and you're like, oh. Yeah. This is touching. Yeah, we should link to it. Yeah. Um, probably too difficult to summarize in a way that would capture the essence of why it's worth reading. Yeah, but, but Utopia Lowell, fantastic story. Very fun to read. Very much in, I would say, the the style of HPMOR even. Yeah, well, a little more slapstick, but yeah. um, it's also like, what, half an hour read? It was, yes, it, yes. It took me maybe half an hour, and I'm a slow reader, so. Yeah, it's it's only 5,000 words. It is a short story, highly recommended. Um, I was sad to find out that... Uh, it ended the way it did, kind of. You, the we, AI was not the way that I would want the AI to be. That's no? it. <laughs> we This part right here, we will put it on the next episode <laughs> okay. after people have had two weeks to read. Oh. But go ahead. Uh, what oh. were you upset about the AI? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> well, we have the power to bend time. <laughs> it is inherent in computer technology. <laughs> okay. We're going to spoil that story that we were talking about. What was it called? Utopia Lol. We're going to spoil Utopia Lol. I strongly encourage you to read it and then listen to it if you want to afterwards. It's a really fun story. It's worth getting it without the spoiler. And it doesn't take that long to read. Cool. And it's available free online. Not only is it free, available free online to read, it is available uh, in a podcast as well because Strange Horizon podcasts all their fiction, read by Anaya Lay, who was also a voice in Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. Cool. Yeah. Who did they voice in Methods? Uh, she did, God, it was a minor character. I think it was the girl that Snape bribed with a large ruby in the dungeons in Confessor, the interlude right. with the Confessor. How fun. Chapter. Yeah. At this point, we talked about the story Utopia Lol for a number of minutes. We are removing it from this episode to avoid spoilers, and we'll add it to the end of the next episode in two weeks. However, if you want to hear it early, it is available to our Patreon subscribers right now. Otherwise, you can hear it in two weeks. And maybe we could go back to the two topics that we were kind of in between. One is, is this EV even possible? Can we even agree on what we want our transhumanist future to be like? And two... Like, in in particular, what we may disagree on is the the nannying. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I guess I also wanted to bring up the conundrum of related to nannying, how much you people should be able to alter themselves. Maybe we can say that they should just have the autonomy to do whatever they choose, but they should be warned strenuously. Mm-hmm. For instance, like when I was talking about how maybe I want to expand my memory and brain capacity to the point where I will get bored of my friends, Mm -hmm. even a whole lot of friends. There are humans on Earth who have, I forget what it's called, super autobiographical memory Mm -hmm. is what I call it. Um, I think they're, I remember James McGaha, I watched him give a talk about it like eight years ago, who right, is yeah. interesting. It turns out it's different parts of the brain that remember different kinds of things. Like your declarative mm. memory is different part of your brain. Then that's why people with amnesia can still learn new things or why, you know, you can, uh, et cetera. But people with perfect autobi- autobiographical memories, I don't think reported that problem. They but did they're... report the problem of being less happy than the average person because they remembered every bad thing that ever yeah. happened to them by somebody and every, oh. vindi- and every vindictive comment from every asshole in elementary school. They but... also have the, um, even with their enhanced memory, they still have basically the same Dunbar number that an average person would have, I expect. That's like right? what, 140 people? I think it's like 150 to 
around there. Yeah, I, I think close. it depends on the person, yeah. but I've heard uh, between 100 and 200 with yeah. an average about 150. Yeah. For me, it's like 20. <laughs> <laughs> we should really quickly <laughs> define the Dunbar number for people who aren't familiar with it. Right. Uh, would you like to? Since you brought it up. Okay, I will. Uh, so the Dunbar number, or as I have heard it called, and which I like to call it because it is much more fun this way, the monkey sphere. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, I've never heard it put that way before. <laughs> oh, really? It's <laughs> awesome. Okay. <laughs> is the uh, maximum number of uh, strong personal connections that people can have with other people. Mm, is it strong personal connections though? Because some people at the, at the outside of your sphere are not like strong connections, but they're like the number of people you can kind of keep track of as being in your general social vicinity. Yeah. Well, I mean, right? by strong personal connections, I think of like people on Facebook who have 500 friends. Mm. That's still sort of a social connection because it's through Facebook, but it's not one that I really consider as counting as strong, you know? Mm, okay. So... I heard it like in the ability to like keep track of like keep track of that many people in your mind of like, oh yeah, that's that's Jim. He's married to so and so and they like tennis. Okay. Like have that level of, of connection with people. For right? the friendly acquaintance level, perhaps. Yeah. There's probably an operational definition that's better than all three of these. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but 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 yeah. think of someone that you know in real life as at least a friendly acquaintance level that about hundred fifty with the one to two hundred range being um what most people can handle. And after that, they top out and they just, they can't handle more people. They have to lose some people. And I can imagine that if everyone upgraded their Dunbar number, um, that could cause some problems with with socializing, perhaps. Oh, what kind of problems? Interesting problems. What kind of problems do you think? Like people feeling lonely more easily if they're... Oh, huh. despite knowing more people? No, well, because they now need more to have more relationships do you think it changes how many relationships maybe. they would need to have? I don't know, maybe. Hmm. Maybe that that capacity is one of the things that affects our social needs. Okay. Maybe just boredom, again, is one of the things. Um, if you can keep track of a gazillion relationships, like, are you going to get bored with fewer? I think that's an unknown cognitive question because yeah. we don't have... I yeah. mean, it's hard for me to speculate because that's a very different yeah. kind of person um i did have a good definition of dunbar's number from wikipedia okay so is a suggested cognitive cognitive limit to the number of people with whom one can maintain stable social relationships dash relationships in which an individual knows who each person is and how each person relates to every other person okay yeah i like it um as far as whether or not having that number go up or down would make people happier or sadder uh i I'm struggling to imagine why it make people worse off. Um, I think it's not, I don't think that's, it's not defined as like the, the, the number of people that someone needs to know to be, to be happy and flourish. Right. right? It's just the number of people that you can just you can. currently yeah. keep track of. But so if I think, you didn't I think have... dialing that knob a little bit wouldn't really ruin anything unless you turn it. I, I mean, unless well, you, you never... didn't attune the adjacent knobs appropriately too. Right. You never know. Maybe you need to have a, a complexity of a level where a certain percentage of that is, is full in order for you to feel like you are living in a socially rich enough world. Otherwise, the world seems bleak and empty. And what if just increasing your IQ itself makes you more likely to get bored with shit? It probably does, judging by the number of miserable artists that I hear about. Yeah, and just in general, I think, isn't isn't IQ slightly negatively correlated with happiness? Probably. Yeah. I have, I know that, like, to the extent that, like, religi religiosity and IQ anti-correlate, mm -hmm. uh, I know that, like, um... I don't know what the nice way to put it. Like people who would identify like with smart groups, like skeptics and atheists tend to have like higher rates of alcoholism and depression. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would seem to suggest some sort of relationship, at least mm -hmm. loosely, depending on how well you want to say those things are tied together very closely. And it's hard to point, figure out which one is the causal factor. Well, I don't know if being more depressed would make you smarter. No, no, no. But uh, maybe religion makes you happier. And oh, since right, right, right. being smarter means you're likely to be less religious that mm -hmm. is where the unhappiness could come from rather than the smartness itself, as potentially. A non, as a non-religious person, I'm going to go ahead and just spell out the <laughs> alternative where, where stupid people are more religious and stupidness <laughs> equals happiness. <laughs> not saying that's true. I just felt like the other side of the coin needed to be shown some light there for a second. I mean, um, there is pretty strong evidence that religion itself is a ca causal factor. Well, okay, I'm not going to say itself, but the the social, social aspect of religion is... Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's not... I mean, that's... 
distinct enough from religion that you yeah. can get that in other places, yeah. right? Like we have our rationality meetups and stuff. It is um, it is really hard though to to get that kind of community bonding and social structure. Yeah, if you're not going to threaten yeah. somebody with eternal torture, right. it's hard to get them to do whatever it, you want. So <laughs> like come every week and tithe. So, but it, I I I've been thinking lately. I think the the whole you have to come every Sunday, sort of a good adaptation for once you get really busy and an adult. Like when you're a kid or in your teens, early 20s, it doesn't really matter. But once you start getting really busy and adult and you just don't have the time to get together and socialize with other people, the being forced to show up every freaking Sunday turns out to be a good thing. Yeah, I guess I just sort of worry about like what goes into it to make it forced, right? Right. Well, like eternal it, damnation. Right. So like, <laughs> I feel like that's probably a stick that you isn't an ingredient in a good <laughs> mental architecture, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sticks a little too big. A little too big. A little too sharp. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are all kinds of things that I kind of worry about that people have the options to, but yet, then again, I just want them to be able to do it. Like, wireheading. Mm. I don't know if we've given a good op- operational definition of that. Maybe we did last time, I can't remember. Oh, um... I'm pretty sure we've talked, talked about, about it a few times. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> Maybe I'm... For some reason, unable to draw to mind exactly what wireheading... I know uh, qualitatively what you're getting at, but I don't have a good definition if someone oh. asked me. Well, I like to talk about wireheading uh, on two levels. One is the very basic, simplistic, like, artificial stimulation of your pleasure centers. Mm-hmm. And maybe even so much that you can't focus on anything else but pleasure. But then there's sophisticated wireheading, where you will receive not just pleasure, but, like, feelings of importance, love, excitement, et cetera, all from, from sources that don't actually have to do with, all just directly stimulated, so to speak, or, or from sources that aren't what you would normally associate those feelings with. For instance, um, if you're talking to a stimulated NPC type person and you have like this deep, meaningful, loving relationship with them, but they are not a person and they do not have those feelings. And all they say is, welcome to Corneria. Or transcendent love. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking San Francisco from Unsung, yeah. um, <laughs> where I feel like they had to stretch what the cause of that was a little bit, but everything's weird in that story. So yeah. it probably works everything's out. Weird. <laughs> um, so the latter is undesirable because you want your states of minds to be tangled up with like the thing with the way things really are yeah Yeah. because i have and i think most people but maybe not everyone uh has actual preferences about external reality and not just experience agreed and yet i was the one who got the look last time for being sentimental about meat space (laughs) (laughs) you mean like your experiences regarding other minds not like yeah I, I, i don't tend to have strong preferences about stuff I have preferences about other minds. The stuff is just mainly for the purpose of the experiences, right? But the other minds, that's what... I think that I also know. ties back into the CEV thing quite a lot because yeah. I think there are people who would disagree with you that minds are not the only thing that are important. And mm-hmm. the, they they would it would be very hard for their future extrapolated volition to match up with yours. Yeah, for real. For the record, I am a big fan of like, uh, what do you call it? physical stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wouldn't say that it matters in a way that is relatable. Like, an, um, I think matters is doing, uh, some equivocation there and at least in, in my mind and probably somebody else's. So like, it doesn't matter like in the sense that if I took this really cool fossil and smashed it with a hammer that I did anything wrong to the fossil. Mm-hmm. Right. It doesn't matter in the sense that like it cares about what happens to it or that I, it, it matters in the sense that it's important to things with minds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Like it doesn't have any worth just at the bottom of the ocean right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's only cool as the fact that it's potentially findable by things that would care to look at it. So that's the part of the way that I care about, like how things actually are. So like if I was in simulation and I was finding cool fossils every day that wouldn't or even like just spread out far enough to where like I kept finding it interesting. That would seem less rewarding to me knowing that they were put there for us to find and like deliberately. It'd be like finding a mining node in World of Warcraft. (laughs) I was thinking like uh, in Diablo where uh, like the bonuses and like those fountains that, you know, grant double XP or stuff are spread out just far enough Mm -hmm. to like 
make it fun to find them every time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I remember I was playing this once, and Rachel was watching, and she was like, "How?" I and I told her previously that some half dozen people had died playing this game from like dehydration, oh, shit. Um, or starvation, however they died. And like same with like World of Warcraft and other games, yeah, or, yeah. but she was like, I don't get how that could like this is not fun to watch. I'm like, but watch this just like for for five minutes and see what's happening. Like enemies are spread out far enough to where like I'm stressed but not overwhelmed. I keep getting bonuses but not so often that they're like unrewarding. Mm-hmm. Like just it's it's almost hitting that perfect pleasure center crack, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's not like a digression. So let's see if I can make it relevant. In a in a simulated world, I can imagine it feeling sort of like that. Like playing Diablo doesn't matter. Yeah. And it, it, all right, I'm sort of butchering that analogy, but I, I guess it's not, maybe I'm not doing a good job of articulating where I'm coming from, which might mean that I'm not coming from a place that makes any sense. Maybe you're talking yourself out of liking video games. No, I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> if I'm talking myself out of liking reality oh. or meat space. And I don't That's think I am, sick. but okay. since I'm doing such a poor job defending it, I'm wondering <laughs> if I actually, uh, I think it's, just, it's, it's interesting in a way that I don't feel like a fake version could be. If I had a thing and I told you, um, when I met Muhammad Ali, he touched this particular thing and he, you can touch it too now. Mm-hmm. Does, does that? Yeah. It's yeah? that sort of like, I mean, so like my brother went to Prague, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. And I asked him to bring me back a cool rock yeah. and he brought me back a cobblestone, like, like the, I don't know. It's he didn't pry it out of the street, did he? I think he did. Oh my God. Which is a drag for the street. But it's really <laughs> cool for me knowing that, that this was part of history. You son of a bitch. <laughs> we can't put it back. Um, so, whatever. Or, like, I also have a friend who went to Hawaii asked for a rock from her, too. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it was a piece of, um, like, what do you call recently dried lava? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, that was cool to me because that has a history that I can appreciate. And it's a different kind of history than the rock from Prague, mm-hmm. right? I would ask the AI to scan it, extract all information from it, and destroy it. See, you two could not have a f- coherent <laughs> t- future together. Well, but see, like, one is just, like, it's less rewarding to me knowing that it's duplicate. Like, um... Why destroy it? Because well, those atoms can be used for other things. Oh, oh, if it was yours. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, you wouldn't take away Stevens, though. No. <laughs> okay, all right. I was like, why are you destroying Stevens' rock? Because <laughs> I don't want him to have it. <laughs> <laughs> it's vital to fulfill a prophecy. <laughs> so this is this is purely just, like... I don't know, biological essentialism, like written, you know, projected onto stuff. But I think it'd be really cool to own like Isaac Newton's original notebook that he took his notes in mm-hmm. uh, while we're, while building calculus or, you know, uh, gra- theory of gravity or something, right? Um, having a copy that was made and there's two, 20 million in production would be less rewarding than having the original that he held and turned with his own hands, right? Mm-hmm. Like, even though they're the exact same or close enough and they contain the same amount of information or whatever, something... That it's just part of my brain finds it really cool to know that this was handled by, you know, a big moment in history and by a big person in history. Here's a fun question. What if someone made a atom for atom exact replica and took the two and put them in a box and shook them <laughs> and you could never again in the future tell which one was the original one? Would they have destroyed something of value? Pause, because I'm thinking about this. Um, like, there's a George Carlin quip of if famous paintings can be forged well enough to fool experts what makes the original so valuable mm-hmm. and the answer is for the art i don't know and nothing and like so again yeah you're right nothing matters about this book especially if there's you know a duplicate that looked the same and you even but, still have the original book you just don't know which one it is right i i mean there was actually a study done and i looked it up once because i mentioned it uh i don't know a few years ago because i heard about it 10 plus years ago where they offered, I think this was like skeptics and atheists, mm-hmm. like, hey, if we could take your wedding ring and put it in this duplicator machine that destroyed the original and gave you a copy and a thousand dollars, would you do it? Yes. A lot of them, and, well, and so would yeah. I, yeah. which is weird because it's just stuff, but I think it's because only I care about it. Yeah. And like, it doesn't have like a history beyond like my scope, but a lot of people said no mm. because they liked theirs. And even though like they, and so that, that was used to kind of make the point that like they thought there was something more to it than their atoms and and maybe that some people were making that mistake. I'm not really sure. I mean, I can see how people might have this inhibition, maybe grounded in the sense that there's something else about about it that we missed, and so we need the original in case we missed something about it. And then mm. you know, I mean, like a rubbing on one of the pages that wouldn't come through, like and it just hands 
translation or, or something. Or even or hand, like uh, the, you could scan it for some radioactive signature that would teach you something about science or whatever. Right. Yeah, and that's that's true, but that that is distinct that from what the point from like the, the it is sort of, that I'm I'm making. It, yeah, it is sort of cheating the the thought experiment. The thought experiment is that there's they're literally identical. Yeah. yeah. My own personal answer would be that I think something valuable was destroyed, but the only thing that it would be is humanity's psychological attachment to a specific object. Which is a worthless attachment. Let's get rid of it. <laughs> Which at least we can say is a sometimes uh, overemphasized attachment. Yeah, I'm willing, I'm willing yeah. to concede that much. <laughs> I, I, I will say there's a lot of things I wouldn't sacrifice for that attachment. Like I wouldn't let a baby die for that attachment. Would you let a kitten die? A cat? A dog? If the answer is yes, we're not friends, so you can just lie. <laughs> I'm going to take the fifth on that one. <laughs> the, I mean, it depends what you're talking about. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, but but the fact that there is that psychological weight invested in things, I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. Like you said, it was a stupid, a stupid psychological thing, and we should get rid of it. And I think it's some, a lot of times overvalued. But I don't think we should get rid of entire it, it entirely because it makes humans a little more complex, and that. Is fun. More permutations of humans that you can get. Also, if we're worried about the like cognitive fallout from shifting the dials on Dunbar's limit, yeah, uh, we should also should worry be. about like how much this could fuck with people if suddenly right. they didn't care about like historical artifacts or things that they previously found very valuable, just because even though they're things, right? I, I agree with. I the think that's probably tied caution. to a lot of other stuff. Yeah. So that sounds like a good Chesterton invention not to cross, <laughs> at least until we fully understand what we're doing. I would want the AI to really investigate all these things so that we can have more control over our, our psychology. All right. I can get behind that. I mean, certainly nothing's uh, off the table of what's worth looking into. Yeah. yeah. I, I look forward to to altering my psychology in many different ways. I do too. Um, I'd like to be l less biased, but probably there are also some biases that I wouldn't get rid of. It, yeah. that I I'm wouldn't. more biased. I'm going to just say you want to be a, a lot less rational. Right. No, I agree. I mean, that's that's one of the allures of, of transhumanism is that there's no there's no reason that these things are like in principle off the table. Like saying I want to be happier, you know, right now means, yeah, you can take this pill that'll like kill your sex drive and make your hair fall out and whatever. Like, you know, I'm not sure if any, you know, that's actually a, a side effect, but you can list off all the scary side effects of pills that might also make you a little bit happier. But like if the idea that like, no, you could just like, you know, put your, your average hedonic whatever measurement on a scale of one to a hundred just bump that up by like 10 mm -hmm. like if that was doable without any fallout or i think that is in principle doable without any fallout you know like i want to have more motivation like i want to be less uh suffer less from you know acrasia where you know i, I eat things i shouldn't eat because i'm trying to be healthier or something right mm -hmm. little tweaks that you make to yourself to make yourself much more psychologically happy and flourished i don't know if that's a word mm -hmm. eudaimonic <laughs> yeah thank you <laughs> Uh, those those are the kind of things that I look forward to. That and obviously like the, the hardware upgrades would be awesome too. So, uh, did you see my thing on Facebook? I now have a short story collection that I have put out. Yes. Yeah. All right. Spoiler. What? I bought one, and I'm gonna oh, make you cool. autograph it. So. Oh, fantastic! I, I even shelled out for the physical copy. Cool. So, well, uh, yeah, no, that's you. awesome. Yeah, and I haven't read all of them, and I can bring back the the one magazine that has one of your stories in it, since it'll be in that book. Yes. So. Yes, it is. Yeah. So I have a collection out that people can buy uh, as an ebook or as an actual physical book that has the five stories that I have published so far. Huzzah! Uh, my collection is called Red Legacy and Other Stories, and it is available at Amazon and various other places where you can buy ebooks and physical copy at Amazon as well. Cool. Okay, but yeah, we've been going at this for a while, so we should uh, sign off. We will mention to people that they can comment if they want to on the subreddit slash r slash the Bayesian Conspiracy or at our website, thebayesianconspiracy.com. Or if they don't want to comment publicly, they can reach us at Bayesian Conspiracy Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, we want to give a mad shout out to all our uh, Patreon supporters. And, of course, to Kyle, our sound engineer, who makes us sound great and saves us so much time every week. Cool. And if you, you know, don't uh, have the ability to easily support the show and you don't, whatever, for whatever reason, aren't inclined to, that's totally cool. There are other ways to do it. You can uh, leave a review on iTunes or your other podcast apps. You can... Uh, Share yeah. it on Facebook. Share it on Facebook, on social media, Twitter. You can trap a friend on a road trip and force them to listen to an episode. <laughs> um, whatever you one of the better ones. Right. Whatever you want to do. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back in a couple weeks. Cool. Bye. Bye.